Beyond Pandora by Robert J. Martin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. Beyond Pandora by Robert J. Martin. The doctor's pen paused over the chart on his desk. This is your third set of teeth, I believe. His patient nodded. That's right, doctor but they were pretty slow in coming in this time. The doctor looked up quizzically. Is that the only reason you think you might need a booster shot? Oh, no, of course not. The man leaned forward and placed one hand, palm up, on the desk. Last year, I had an accident. Stupid. Lost a thumb. He shrugged apologetically. It took almost six months to grow back. Thoughtfully, the doctor leaned back in his chair. Hmm, I see. As the man before him made an involuntary movement toward his pocket, the doctor smiled. Go on. Smoke if you want to. Picking up the chart, he murmured, Six months. Much too long. Strange we didn't catch this at the time. He read silently for a few moments, then began to fill out a form clipped to the folder. Well, I think you are probably due for another booster about now. They'll have to be the usual test. Not that there's much doubt. We like to be certain. The middle-aged man seemed relieved. Then, on second thought, he hesitated uneasily. Why? Is there any danger? Amusement flickered across the doctor's face, turned smoothly into a reassuring half-smile. Oh, no. There's absolutely no danger involved. None at all. We have tissue regeneration pretty well under control now. Still, I'm sure you understand that accurate records and data are very necessary to further research and progress. Reassured, the patient thawed and became confidential. I see. Well, I suppose it's kind of silly, but I don't much like shots. It's not that they hurt, it's just I guess I'm old-fashioned. I still feel kind of creepy about the whole business. Slightly embarrassed, he paused and asked defensively, Is that unusual? The doctor smiled openly now. Not at all, not at all. Things have moved pretty fast in the past few years. I suppose it takes people's emotional reactions a while to catch up with developments that, logically, we accept as matter of fact. He pushed his chair back from the desk. Maybe it's not too hard to understand. Take fire, for example. Man lived in fear of fire for a good many hundred thousand years, and rightly so, because he hadn't learned to control it. The principle's the same. First, you learn to protect yourself from a thing, then control it. And eventually, we learn to harness it for a useful purpose. He gestured towards the man's cigarette. Even so, man still instinctively fears fire, even while he uses it. In the case of tissue regeneration, where the change took place so rapidly, in just a generation or so, that instinctive fear is even more understandable, although quite as unjustified, I assure you. The doctor stood up, indicating that the session was ending. While his patient scrambled to his feet, hastily putting out a cigarette, the physician came round the desk. He put his hand on the man's shoulder. Relax. Take it easy. Nothing to worry about. This is a wonderful age we live in. Barring a really major accident, there's no reason why you shouldn't live at least another 75 years. After all, that's a very remarkable viral complex we have doing your repair work. As they walked to the door, the man shook his head. Guess you're right, Doc. It's certainly done a good job so far, and I guess you specialists know what you're doing even if folks don't understand it. At the door, he paused and half-turned to the doctor. Let's say, something I meant to ask you. This stuff, uh, this vaccine. Where did it come from? Seems to me I heard somewhere that, way back before you fellows got it tamed, it was something else. Dangerous. There was another name for it. Do you know what I mean? The doctor's hand tightened on the doorknob. Yes, I know, he said grimly. But not many laymen remember. Just keep in mind what I told you. With any of these things, the pattern is protection, then control, then useful application. He turned to face his patient. Back in the days before we put it to work for us, rebuilding tissue, almost ending aging and disease, the active basis for our vaccine caused a whole group of diseases in itself. Returning the man's searching gaze, the doctor opened the door. We've come a long way since then, you see, he said quietly. In those days... They called it cancer. End of Beyond Pandora by Robert J. Martin Recording by James Christopher JX Christopher at Yahoo.com
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark. Blessed are the Meek by G. C. Edmondson. Blessed are the meek. Every strength is a weakness, and every weakness is a strength. And when the strong start smashing each other's strength, the weak may turn out to be, instead, the wise. The strangers landed just before dawn, incinerating a good lee of bottomland in the process. Their machines were already busily digging up the topsoil. The old one watched, squinting into the morning sun. He sighed, hitched up his saffron robes, and started walking down toward the strangers. Griffin turned, not trying to conceal his excitement. You're the linguist. See what you can get out of him. I might, Kung Su ventured sourly if you'd go weed the air machine or something. This is going to be hard enough without a lot of kibitzers cramping my style and scaring old Pruneface here half to death. I see your point, Griffin answered. He turned and started back toward the diggings. Let me know it if you make any progress with a local language. He stopped whistling and strove to control the jauntiness of his gait. Must be the lower gravity and extra oxygen, he thought. I haven't bounced along like this for thirty years. Nice place to settle down if some promoter doesn't turn it into an old folks' home. He sighed and glanced over the diggings. The rammed earth walls were nearly obliterated by now. Nothing lost, he reflected. It's all on tape, and they're no different from a thousand others, at any rate. Griffin opened a door in the transparent bubble from which Albanez was operating the diggers. Anything? he inquired. Nothing so far, Albanez reported. What's the score on this job? I missed the briefing. How'd you make it all the way out on three, by the way? The same stuff, pottery shards and the usual junk. See it once, you've seen it all. Well, Griffin began. It looks like the same thing here again. We've pretty well covered this system, and you know how it is. Rammed earth walls here and there, pottery shards, flint, bronze and iron artifacts. That's it. They got to the Iron Age on every planet, and then bluey. Artifacts all made for humanoid hands, I suppose. I wonder if they were close enough to have crossbred with humans. I couldn't say. Griffin observed dryly. From the looks of old Pruneface, I doubt if we'll ever find a human female with sufficiently detached attitude to find out. Who's Pruneface? He came ambling down out of the hills this morning and walked into camp. You mean you've actually found a live humanoid? There's got to be a first time for everything. Griffin opened the door and started climbing the hill toward Kung Su and Pruneface. Well, have you gotten beyond the me Charlie stage yet? Griffin inquired at breakfast two days later. Kung Su gave an inscrutable East Los Angeles smile. As a matter of fact, I'm a little farther along. Joe was amazingly cooperative. Joe? Spell it C-H-O-U if you want to be exotic. It's still pronounced Joe, and that's his name. The language is monosyllabic and tonal. I happen to know a similar language. You mean this humanoid speaks Chinese? Griffin was never sure whether Kung was ribbing him or not. Not Chinese. The vocabulary is different, but the syntax and phonemes are nearly identical. I'll speak it perfectly in a week. It's just a question of memorizing two or three thousand new words. Incidentally, Joe wants to know why you're digging up his bottom land. He was all set to flood it today. Don't tell me he plants rice, Griffin exclaimed. 
I don't imagine it's rice, but it needs flooding, whatever it is. Ask him how many humanoids there are on this planet. I'm way ahead of you, Griffin. He says there are only a few thousand left. The rest all destroyed in a war with the barbarians. Barbarians? They're extinct. How many races were there? I'll get to that if you'll stop interrupting, Kung rejoined testily. Joe says there are only two kinds of people, his own dark, straight-haired kind and the barbarians. They have curly hair, white skin, and round eyes. You'd pass for a barbarian, according to Joe, if only you didn't have a face full of hair. He wants to know how things are going on the other planets. I suppose that's my cue to break into a cold sweat and feel a premonition of disaster. Griffin tried to smile and almost made it. Not necessarily, but it seems our Iron Age man is fairly well informed in extraplanetary affairs. I guess I better start learning the language. Thanks to the spade work Kung Su had done in preparing hypno-recordings, Griffin had a working knowledge of the rational people's language eleven days later when he sat down to drink herb-infused hot water with Joe and the other old ones in a low-roof building around which clustered a village of two hundred humanoids. He fidgeted through interminable ritualistic cups of hot water. Eventually, Joe hid his hands in the sleeves of his robe and turned with an air of polite inquiry. Now we get down to business, Griffin thought. Joe, you know by now why we're digging up your bottom land. We'll recompense you in one way or another. Meanwhile, could you give me a little local history? Joe smiled like a well-nourished bodhisattva. Approximately how far back would you like me to begin? At the beginning. How long is a year on your planet? Joe inquired. Your year is eight and a half days longer. Our day is three hundred heartbeats longer than yours. Joe nodded his thanks. More water? Griffin declined, suppressing a shudder. Five million years ago... We were limited to one planet, Joe began. The court astronomer had a vision of our planet in flames. I imagine you'd say our sun was about to go nova. The empress was disturbed and ordered a convocation of seers. One fasted over long and saw an answer. As the dying seer predicted, the son of heaven came with fire-breathing dragons. The fairest of maidens and the strongest of our young men were taken to serve his warriors. We served them honestly and faithfully. A thousand years later their empire collapsed, leaving us scattered across the universe. Three thousand years later a new race of barbarians conquered our planets. We surrendered naturally and soon were serving our new masters. Five hundred years passed and they destroyed themselves. This has been the pattern of our existence from that day to this. You mean you've been slaves for five million years? Griffin was incredulous. Servitude has ever been a refuge for the scholar and the philosopher. But what point is there in such a life? Why do you continue living this way? What is the point in any way of life? Continued existence. Personal immortality is neither desirable nor possible. We settled for perpetuation of the race. But what about self-determination? You know enough astronomy to understand Nove. Surely you realize it could happen again. What would you do without a technology to build spaceships? Many stars have gone Nova during our history. Usually the barbarians came in time. When they didn't... You mean you don't really care? All barbarians ask that sooner or later, Joe smiled. Sometimes toward the end they even accuse us of destroying them. We don't. Every technology bears the seeds of its own destruction. The stars are older than the machinery that explores them. You used technology to get from one system to another. We used it, but we were never part of it. When machines fail, their people die. We have no machines. 
What would you do if this sun were to Nova? We can serve you. We are not unintelligent. Willing to work your way around the galaxy, eh? But what if we refuse to take you? The race would go on. Kung Su tells me there is no life on planets of this system. But there are other systems. You're whistling in the dark, Griffin scoffed. How do you know if any of the rational people survive? How far back does your history go? Joe inquired. It's hard to say exactly, Griffin replied. Our earliest written records date back some 7,000 years. You are all of one race? No. You may have noticed Kung Su is slightly different from the rest of us. Yes, Griffin. I have noticed. When you return, ask Kung Su for the legend of creation. More hot water? Joe stirred, and Griffin guessed the interview was over. He drank another ritual cup, made his farewells, and walked thoughtfully back to camp. Kung, Griffin asked over coffee next afternoon, how well up are you on Chinese mythology? Oh, fair, I guess. It isn't my field, but I remember some of the stories my grandfather used to tell me. What is your legend of creation? Griffin persisted. It's pretty well garbled, but I remember something about the Son of Heaven bringing the early settlers from a land of two moons on the back of his fire-breathing dragon. The dragon got sick and died, so they couldn't ever get back to heaven again. There's a lot of stuff about devils, too. What about devils? I don't remember too well. They were supposed to do terrible things to you, and even to your unborn children if they ever caught you. They must have been pretty stupid, though. They couldn't turn corners. My grandfather's store had devil screens at all the doors, so you had to turn a corner to get in. The first time I saw the lead baffles at the pile chamber doors on the ship, it reminded me of home, sweet home. By the way, some young men from the village were around today. They want to work passage to the next planet. What do you think? Griffin was silent for a long time. Well, what do you say? We can use some hand labor for the delicate digging. You want to put them on? Might as well, Griffin answered. There's a streetcar every millennium anyway. What do you mean by that? You wouldn't understand. You sold your birthright to the barbarians. The End I Like Martian Music by Charles E. Fritch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite I Like Martian Music by Charles E. Fritch Longtree played. His features relaxed into a gentle smile of happiness, and his body turned a bright red-orange. Longtree sat before his hole in the ground and gazed thoughtfully among the sandy red hills that surrounded him. His skin at the moment was a medium yellow, a shade between pride and happiness at having his brief symphony almost completed, with just a faint tinge of red to denote that uncertain, cautious approach to the last note which had eluded him thus far. He sat there unmoving for a while, and then he picked up his blowstring and fitted the mouthpiece between his thin lips. He blew into it softly, and at the same time gently strummed the three strings stretching the length of the instrument. The note was a firm, clear one which would have made any other musician proud. But Longtree frowned, and at the disappointment his body flushed a dark green and began taking on a purple cast of anger. Hastily he put down the blowstring and tried to think of something else. Slowly his normal color returned. Across the nearest hill came his friend, Channel Jumper, striding on the long, thin, ungainly legs that had given him his name. His skin radiated a blissful orange. Long tree, Channel Jumper exclaimed enthusiastically, collapsing on the ground nearby and folding his legs around him. How's the symphony coming? Not so good, Long Tree admitted sadly, and his skin turned green at the memory. If I don't get that last note, I may be this color the rest of my life. 
Why don't you play what you've written so far? It's not very long, and it might cheer you up a bit. You're a good friend, Channel Jumper, Longtree thought, and when Red Sand and I are married after the music festival, we'll have you over to our hole for dinner. As he thought this, he felt his body take on an orange cast, and he felt better. I can't seem to get that last note, he said, picking up the blowstring again and putting it into position. The final note must be conclusive, something complete in itself, and yet be able to sum up the entire meaning of the symphony preceding it. Channel Jumper hummed sympathetically. That's a big job for one note. It might be a sound no one has ever heard before. Longtree shrugged. It may even sound alien, he admitted, but it's got to be the right note. Play, and we'll see, Channel Jumper urged. Longtree played, and as he played, his features relaxed into a gentle smile of happiness, and his body turned orange. Delicately, he strummed the three strings of the blowstring with his long nailed fingers. Softly, he pursed his frail lips and blew expertly into the mouthpiece. From the instrument came sounds the like of which Channel Jumper had never before heard. The Martian sat and listened in evident rapture, his body radiating a golden glow of ecstasy. He sat and dreamed, and as the music played, his spine tingled with growing excitement. The music swelled, surrounding him, permeating him, picking him up in a great hand and sweeping him into new and strange and beautiful worlds. Worlds of tall metal structures, of vast stretches of greenness, and of water, and of trees, and of small, pale creatures that flew giant metal insects. He dreamed of these things which his planet Mars had not known for millions of years. After a while the music stopped, but for a moment neither of them said anything. At last Channel Jumper sighed. It's beautiful, he said. Yes, Longtree admitted. But, Channel Jumper seemed puzzled, but somehow it doesn't seem complete. Almost, but not quite. As though, as though... Longtree sighed. One more note would do it? One more note, no more, no less, at the end of the crescendo, could tie the symphony together and end it. But which one? I've tried them all, and none of them fit. His voice had risen higher in his excitement, and Channel Jumper warned. Careful, you're beginning to turn purple. I know, Longtree said mournfully, and the purple tint changed to a more acceptable green. But I've got to win first prize at the festival tomorrow. Red Sand promised to marry me if I did. You can't lose, Channel Jumper told him, and then remembered. If you can get that last note. If, Longtree echoed despairingly, as though his friend had asked the impossible. I wish I had your confidence, Chan. You're orange most of the time, while I'm a spectrum. I haven't your artistic temperament, Channel Jumper told him. Besides, orange is such a homely color, I feel ashamed to have it all the time. As he said this, he turned green with shame, and Longtree laughed at the paradox. Channel Jumper laughed, too, glad that he had diverted his friend's attention from the elusive and perhaps non-existent note. Did you know the space rocket is due pretty soon, he said? Perhaps even in time for the music festival. Space rocket? Oh, uh, I forgot you were busy composing and didn't get to hear it, Channel Jumper said. Well, Big Wind, who has a telescope in his hole, told me a rocket is coming through space towards us, possibly from the third planet. Oh, Longtree said, not particularly interested. I wonder if they'll look like us, Channel Jumper wondered. If they're intelligent, of course they will, Longtree said, certainly not caring. Their culture will probably be alien, though, and their music— He paused and turned a very deep yellow. Of course. They might even be able to furnish the note I need to complete my symphony. Channel Jumper shook his head. You've got to compose it all yourself, he reminded, or you don't qualify, and if you don't qualify you can't win, and if you don't win you can't marry Red Sand. But just one little note, Longtree said. Channel Jumper shrugged helplessly and turned sympathetically green. I don't make the rules, he said. No. Well, Longtree went on in sudden determination, I'll find that last note if I have to stay permanently purple. Channel Jumper shuddered jestingly at this, but remained pleasantly orange. And I'll leave you alone so you can get to work, he said, unfolding himself. Goodbye, Longtree said, but Channel Jumper's long legs had already taken him over to the nearest sand dune and out of sight. Alone, Longtree picked up the blowstring once more, placed it against his stomach, and gave out with a clear, beautiful experimental note which was, again, not the one he desired. He still had not found it an hour later when the sound came. 
The sound was a low, unpleasant rumble, a sound lower than any Longtree had ever heard, and he wondered what it was. Thinking of it, he remembered he had seen a large flash of fire in the sky a moment before the roar came, but since this last was clearly not likely at all, he dismissed the whole thing as imagination and tried again to coax some new note from the blowstring. A half hour later, Channel Jumper came bounding excitedly over a sand dune. They're here, he cried, screeching to a halt and emitting yellow flashes of color. Who's here? Longtree demanded, turning violet in annoyance at the interruption. The visitors from space, Channel Jumper explained. They landed near my hole. They're little creatures, only half as big as we are, but thicker and gray colored. Gray colored? Longtree repeated incredulously, trying to picture the improbability. But only on the outside, Channel Jumper went on, they have an outside shell that comes off, and inside they're sort of pink, orange. Aha, Longtree said, as though he'd suspected it all the time. Evidently they wear gray suits of some kind, probably for protection. They took them off anyway, Channel Jumper said, eager to impart his knowledge, and they were sort of pink orange underneath. There are only two of them, and one has long hair. Strange, Longtree mused, thinking of their own hairless bodies. Wonder what they want? Channel Jumper shrugged to indicate he didn't know. The short-haired one followed me, he said. Longtree felt the chill blue of fear creep along his spine, but immediate anger at himself changed it conveniently to purple, and he was certain Channel Jumper hadn't noticed. When he had controlled himself, he said, Well, it doesn't matter. I've got to get on with my symphony. That last note. He's here, Channel Jumper announced. What? Channel Jumper pointed eagerly, and Longtree's eyes followed the direction to where the alien stood at the top of a nearby dune, staring at them. Longtree could feel his skin automatically turning red with caution, blending with the sand, while the ever-trusting Channel Jumper remained bright orange. Good gosh! the alien exclaimed. Not only do they look like modified grasshoppers, they change color, too. What did he say? Longtree demanded. How should I know? Channel Jumper said. It's in another language. And its voice, Longtree exclaimed, almost disbelieving it, low, lower than even our drums rumble. And they talk in squeaks yet, the alien told himself aloud. Longtree regarded the alien carefully. As Channel Jumper had said, the creature was short and had close-cropped hair on its head. The legs were brief and pudgy, and Longtree felt a shade of pity for the creature who could obviously not get around as well as they. It was undoubtedly intelligent, the space rocket testified to that, and the fact that the creature's skin color stayed a peaceful pink-orange helped assure Longtree the alien's mission was friendly. The alien raised a short arm and stepped slowly forward. I come in peace, he said, in the language they could not understand. My wife and I are probably the only humans left alive. When we left Earth, most of the population had been wiped out by atomics. I think we were the only ones to get away. Longtree felt his redness subside to orange as he wondered idly what the alien had said. Except for a natural curiosity, he didn't really care, for he remembered suddenly the symphony he had to finish by tomorrow if he were to marry Red Sand. But there was the element of politeness to consider, so he nudged Channel Jumper. Don't just stand there. Say something. Channel Jumper flustered and turned several colors in rapid succession. He stammered, Er, uh, welcome to our planet, O oh visitor from space, and motioned the alien to sit down. That's not very creative, Longtree accused. What's the difference, Channel Jumper pointed out, when he doesn't understand us anyway? You guys don't really look like grasshoppers, the man from Earth apologized, coming forward. It's just the long legs that fooled me from up there. Boy, am I glad to find somebody intelligent on Mars. From the air we couldn't see any cities or anything, and we were afraid the planet didn't have any life. I wish we could understand each other, though." Longtree smiled pleasantly and wished the creature would go away so he could search for the last note to his symphony. He picked up his blowstring so the alien wouldn't sit on it. Play for him, Channel Jumper suggested, seating himself by segments. Just the last part, to see how he reacts. Music is universal, you know. Longtree was going to do just that thing, for despite Channel Jumper's warning that he might compose every single note by himself, he felt an alien viewpoint might be helpful. He started playing. Channel Jumper sat dreaming, glowing radiantly, but the alien seemed somewhat perturbed by the music and fidgeted nervously. Could it be, Longtree wondered, that the incredible beauty of his composition might not translate acceptably to alien ears? 
He dismissed the thought as unlikely. Er, that's a bit high, isn't it? The creature said, shaking his head. Lost in the sweeping melodies, neither Longtree nor Channel Jumper paid any attention to the meaningless syllables. Longtree played on, oblivious to all else, soaring toward the great screaming crescendo that would culminate with the missing note. Vaguely he became aware that the creature had gotten up, and he turned a small part of his attention to the action. Longtree smiled inwardly, pleased, and turned yellow with pride to think that even a man from another planet should so appreciate his symphony that he got up and danced a strange little dance and even sang to the music. The alien held on to his ears and leaped erratically, singing, No, no, stop, it's too high, my head's bursting. Channel Jumper, too, seemed pleased by this show of appreciation, though neither of them understood the words, and Longtree swept into the final notes of the rising crescendo with a gusto he had not previously displayed. He stopped where he had always stopped, and the final note came. It startled the Martians. Then the realization swept over them in glad tides of color. The symphony was complete now. With that final alien sound, Longtree could win both the festival prize and Red Sand with it. The last note was a soft popping sound that had come from the creature from another planet. They looked to see him sagging to the ground, his head soft and pulpy. My symphony's complete, Longtree exclaimed jubilantly, a brilliant yellow now. But Channel Jumper's yellow happiness was tinged with green. A pity, he said, the creature had to give its life in exchange for the note. I believe it really wanted to, Longtree said, turning solemn. Did you see how it danced to the music, as though in the throes of ecstasy, and it didn't change color once? It must have died happy to know it gave itself to a good cause. You could probably get by with claiming to use the creature as an auxiliary instrument, mused Channel Jumper, practical once more, and eliminate any claim that he might have assisted you. But what about the festival? This one looks as though he doesn't have another note in him. There's the other one, Longtree reminded, the one with long hair. We can save that one until tomorrow. Of course, Channel Jumper agreed, standing up. I'll go get it, and you can keep it safe here in your hole until tomorrow night. You're a good friend, Channel Jumper, Longtree began, but the other was already bounding out of sight over a sand dune. Blissfully he raised the blowstring into position and played the opening notes to his symphony. The alien lay unmoving with its head in a sticky puddle, but Longtree took no notice. He didn't even consider that, after the festival, he would never be able to play his symphony again in all its glorious completeness. His spinal column tingled pleasantly, and his skin turned the golden yellow of unbearable happiness. The music was beautiful. End of I Like Martian Music by Charles E. Fritch It's a Small Solar System by Alan Howard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. It's a Small Solar System by Alan Howard. Soon the three representatives of Earth were walking shoulder to shoulder the captain first to touch soil. Know him? Well, you might say I practically grew up with him. He was my hero in those days. I thought few wiser or greater men ever lived. In my eyes he was greater than Babe Ruth, Lindy, or the President. Of course, time and my growing up caused me to bring him into a perspective that I felt to be more consonant with his true position in his field of endeavor. When he died, his friends mourned for fond remembrance of things past, but privately many of them felt that he had outlived his best days. Now with this glorious vindication, I wonder how many of them are still alive to feel the twinge of conscience. Oh, we're delighted, of course, but it seems incredible even today to us elated oldsters, although we were always his staunchest admirers. In retrospect, we can see now that no one believed more than we that he did it strictly for the dollar. It is likely there was always a small core of starry-eyed adolescents who found the whole improbable saga entirely believable, or at least half believed it might be partly true. The attitude of the rest of us ranged from a patronizing disparagement that we thought was expected of us through grudging admiration to out-and-out -out enthusiasm. 
Certainly, if anybody had taken the trouble to consider it, and why should they have, the landing of the first manned ship on our satellite seemed to render him as obsolete as a horde of other lesser and even greater lights. At any rate, it was inevitable that the conquest of the moon would be merely a stepping stone to more distant points. Oh, no, I had nothing to do with the selection of the Red Planet. Coming in as head of Project P-4 in its later stages as I did when Dr. Fredericks died, the selection had already been made. Yes, it's quite likely I may have been plugging for Mars below the conscious level. A combination of chance, expediency, and popular demand made Mars the next target, rather than Venus, which was in some ways the more logical goal. I would have given anything to have gone, but the metaphorical stout heart that one reporter once credited me with is not the same as an old man's actual fatty heart. And there were heartbreak years ahead before the Goddard was finally ready. During this time he slipped further into obscurity while big important things were happening all around us. You're right, that one really big creation of his is bigger than ever. It has passed into the language and meant employment for thousands of people. Too few of them have even heard of him. Of course, he was still known and welcomed by a small circle of acquaintances, but to the world at large he was truly a forgotten man. It is worthy of note that one of the oldest of these acquaintances was present at blast-off time. He happened to be the grandfather of a certain competent young crewman. The old man was a proud figure during the brief ceremonies, and his eyes filled with tears as the mighty rocket climbed straight up on its fiery tail. He remained there gazing up at the sky long after it had vanished. He was heard to murmur, I am glad the kid could go, but it's just a lark to him. He never had a sense of wonder. How could he? Nobody reads any more. Afterward, his senile emotions betraying him, he broke down completely and had to be led from the field. It is rumored he did not live long after that. The Goddard drove on until Mars filled the viz screen. It was planned to make at least a half a dozen braking passes around the planet for observational purposes before the actual business of bringing the ship in for landfall began. As expected, the atmosphere proved to be thin. The speculated Dead Sea areas, oddly enough, turned out to be just that. To the surprise of some, it was soon evident that Mars possessed, or had possessed, a high civilization. The canali of Schiaparelli were indeed broad waterways stretching from pole to pole, too regular to be anything but the work of intelligence. But most wonderful of all were the scattered but fairly numerous large walled cities that dotted the world. Everybody was excited, eager to land and start exercising their specialties. One of the largest of these cities was selected more or less at random. It was decided to set down just outside, yet far enough from the walls to avoid any possibility of damage from the landing jets in the event the city was inhabited. Even if deserted, the entire scientific personnel would have raised a howl that would have been heard back on Earth if just a section of wall was scorched. When planetfall was completed, the observers had time to scan the surroundings. It was seen that the city was very much alive. What keeps them up? marveled Kupchansky, the Aeronautics and Rocketry Authority. The sky swarmed with ships of strange design. The walls were crowded with inhabitants too far away for detailed observation. Even as they looked, an enormous gate opened and a procession of mounted figures emerged. In the event the place was deserted, the captain would have had the honor of being the first to touch Martian soil. While atmospheric and other checks were being run, he gave orders for the previously decided alternative. Captain, semanticist, and anthropologist would make the first contact. With all checks agreeing that it was safe to open locks, soon the three representatives of Earth were walking shoulder to shoulder down the ramp. It was apparent that the two scientists purposely missed stride inches from the end so that it was the captain's foot that actually touched ground first. The cavalcade, though these beasties were certainly not horses, was now near enough to the ship for details to be seen. Surprise and wonderment filled the crew, for while the multi-legged steeds were as alien as anyone might expect to find on an alien world, the riders were very definitely humanoid. Briefly, brightly, and barbarically trapped as they were by earthly standards, they seemed to be little distinguishable from homegrown homo saps. The approaching company appeared to be armed mainly with swords and lances, but also in evidence were some tubular affairs that could very well be some sort of projectile discharging device. The captain suddenly felt unaccountably warm. It was a heavy responsibility. He hoped these Martians wouldn't be the type of madmen who believed in the shoot-first, inquirer-later theory. Even as he stood there, outwardly calm but jittering internally, the Martian riders pulled up ten feet from the Earthmen. 
Their leader, tall, dark-haired, and subtly lighter in hue than his companions, dismounted and approached the captain. With outstretched hand he took the captain's in a firm grip. Let it be recorded here, to the shame of earth, where reading for pleasure is virtually a lost pastime, that not one man on the Goddard realized the significance of what followed. "'How do you do?' he said in perfect English, with an unmistakable trace of southern accent. "'Welcome to Basum. My name is John Carter.'" End of It's a Small Solar System by Alan Howard Operation RSVP. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded for LibriVox by William Hazeltine. Operation RSVP by Henry Beam Piper. Vladimir N. Dzibinski. Foreign Minister, Union of East European Soviet Republics. To Wu Feng Tong, Foreign Minister, United People's Republics of East Asia. 15 January 1984. Honored Sir, Pursuant to our well-known policy of exchanging military and scientific information with the government of friendly powers, my government takes great pleasure in announcing the completely successful final test of our new nuclear rocket-guided missile Marxist Victory. The test launching was made from a position south of Lake Balkash. The target was located in the East Siberian Sea. In order to assist you in appreciating the range of the new guided missile Marxist Victory, let me point out that the distance from launching site to target is somewhat over 50% greater than the distance from launching site to your capital, Nanking. My government is still hopeful that your government will revise its present intransigent position on the Kakun River dispute. I have the honor, etc., 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 V. N. Dzibinski. Wu Feng Tong to Vladimir N. Dzibinski. 7 February 1984 Estimable Sir, my government was most delighted to learn of the splendid triumph of your government in developing the new guided missile Marxist victory, and at the same time deeply relieved. We had, of course, detected the release of nuclear energy incident to the test, and inasmuch as it had obviously originated in the disintegration of a quantity of uranium-235. We had feared that an explosion had occurred at your government's secret uranium plant at Katanga. We have long known of the lax security measures in effect at this plant and have, as a consequence, been expecting some disaster there. I am therefore sure that your government will be equally gratified to learn of the perfection by my government of our own new guided missile celestial destroyer which embodies in greatly improved form many of the features of your own government's guided missile marxist victory naturally your own scientific warfare specialists have detected the release of energy incident to the explosion of our own improved thorium afnium interaction bomb this bomb was exploded over the north polar ice cap about 200 miles south of the pole, on about 35 degrees east longitude, almost due north of your capital city of Moscow. The launching was made from a site in Tibet. Naturally, my government cannot deviate from our present just and reasonable attitude in the Kankum River question. Trusting that your government will realize this, I have the honor to be your obedient and respectful servant, Wu Feng Tung. From New York Times, February 20th, 1984. Afghan ruler fated at Nanking. Amir Sher Ali Abdallah confers with UPREA Prez Sing Li Ying. UEESR Foreign Minister Dzibinski to Maxim G. Kalyankov, Ambassador at Nanking. 3rd March 1984 Comrade Ambassador, 
it is desired that you make immediate secret and confidential repeat secret and confidential inquiry as to the whereabouts of Dr. Dmitry O. Voronov, the noted Soviet rocket expert, designer of the new guided missile Marxist Victory, who vanished a week ago from the Joseph Vilinevich Jugasvili Reaction Proportion Laboratories at Molotov Gorod. It is feared in government circles that this noted scientist has been abducted by agents of the United People's Republics of East Asia, possibly to extract from him, under torture, information of a secret tactical nature. As you know, this is but the latest of a series of such disappearances beginning about five years ago, when the Kakum River question first arose. Your utmost activity in this matter is required. Dubinsky. Ambassador Krylienkov to Foreign Minister Dzubinsky, 9 March 1984 Comrade Foreign Minister, Since receipt of yours of 3384, I have been utilizing all resources at my disposal in the matter of the noted scientist D. O. Voronov, and availing myself of all sources of information, e.g. spies, secret agents, disaffected elements of the local population, and including two UPREA cabinet ministers on my payroll. I regret to report that the results of this investigation have been entirely negative. No one here appears to know anything of the whereabouts of Dr. Voronov. At the same time, there is considerable concern in the UPREA government circles over the disappearances of certain prominent East Asian scientists, e.g. Dr. Hong Fu, the nuclear physicist, Dr. Hin Yang Wu, the great theoretical mathematician, Dr. Meng Xing, the electronics expert. I am informed that UPREA government sources are attributing these disappearances to us. I can only say that I am sincerely sorry this is not the case. Krylienkov Wu Feng Tong to Vladimir N. Duzahubinsky 21 April 1984 Estimable Sir, in accordance with our established policy of free exchange with friendly powers of scientific information, permit me to inform your government that a new mutated disease virus has been developed in our biological laboratories, causing a highly contagious disease similar in symptoms to bubonic plague, but responding to none of the treatments for this latter disease. This new virus strain was accidentally produced in the course of some experiments with radioactivity. In spite of the greatest care, it is feared that this virus has spread beyond the laboratory in which it was developed. We warn you most urgently of the danger that it may have spread to the UEESR, enclosed our list of symptoms, etc. My government instructs me to advise your government that the attitude of your government to the Kakum River question is utterly unacceptable, and will require considerable revision before my government can even consider negotiation with your government on the subject. Your obedient and respectful servant, Wu Feng Tong. From New York Times, May 12, 1984. Afghan ruler fated at Moscow. Amir sees Red Square Troop Review, confers with Premier President Mosergan. Sing Ya, UPREA Ambassador at Moscow, to Wu Feng Tung, 26 June 1984. Venerable and honored sir, I regret humbly that I can learn nothing whatsoever about the fate of the learned scholars of science of whom you inquire namely Hong Fu, Hin Yang Wu, Meng Xing, Yi Ho Li, Wang Fat, and Bao Hu Xin. This inability may be in part due to incompetence of my unworthy self, but none of my many sources of information, including Soviet Minister of Police Morgodov, who is on my payroll, can furnish any useful data whatsoever. I am informed, however, that the UEESR government is deeply concerned about similar disappearances of some of the foremost of their own scientists, including Voronov, Yirinkov, Kangornov, Bakhorin, Himmelfaber, and Palavinsky. 
all of whose dossiers are on file with our Bureau of Foreign Intelligence. I am further informed that the government of the UEESR ascribes these disappearances to our own activities. Ah, venerable and honored sir, if this were only true! Kindly consented to accept compliments of Sing Ya. Zyubinsky to Wu Feng Tung, 6 October 1984. Honored Sir, Pursuant to our well known policy of exchanging scientific information with the governments of friendly powers, my government takes the greatest pleasure in announcing a scientific discovery of inestimable value to the entire world. I refer to nothing less than a positive technique for liquidating rats as a species. This technique involves treatment of male rats with certain types of hard radiations, which not only renders them reproductively sterile, but leaves the rodents so treated in full possession of all other sexual functions and impulses. Furthermore, this condition of sterility is venereally contagious, so that one male rat so treated will sterilize all female rats with which it comes in contact, and these in turn will sterilize all male rats coming in contact with them. Our mathematicians estimate that under even moderately favorable circumstances, the entire rat population of the world could be sterilized from one male rat in approximately 200 years. Rats so treated have already been liberated in the granaries at Odessa. In three months, rat trappings have fallen by 26.4% and grain losses to rats by 32.09%. We are shipping you six dozen sterilized male rats, which you can use for sterilization stock, and by so augmenting their numbers may duplicate our own success. Curiously enough, this effect of venereally contagious sterility was discovered quite accidentally in connection with the use of hard radiations for human sterilization, criminals, mental defectives, etc., Knowing the disastrous possible effects of an epidemic of contagious human sterility, all persons so sterilized were liquidated as soon as the contagious nature of their sterility had been discovered, with the exception of a dozen or so convicts who had been released before this discovery was made. It is believed that at least some of them have made their way over the border and into the territory of the United People's Republics of East Asia. I must caution your government to be on the lookout of them, among a people still practicing ancestor worship, an epidemic of sterility would be a disaster indeed. My government must insist that your government take some definite step toward the solution of the Kakum River question. The present position of the government of the United People's Republics of East Asia on this subject is utterly unacceptable to the government of the Union of East European Soviet Republics, and must be revised very considerably. I have the honor, etc., etc., Vladimir N. Zubinsky. Coded radiogram Zubinsky to Kurienkov, 25 October 1984. Ascertain immediately cause of release of nuclear energy vicinity of Nova Zembla this AM. Zubinsky. Coded radiogram Wu Feng Tong to Sing Ya. 25 October 1984 Ascertain immediately cause of release of nuclear energy vicinity of Nova Zembla this AM. Wu Letter from the Amir of Afghanistan to UEESR Premier President Mosulgren and UPREA President Sung Li Yin. 26 October 1984 Sher Ali Abdallah, Amir of Afghanistan, Master of Kabul, Lord of Herat and Kandahar, Keeper of Kiber Pass, Defender of the True Faith, Servant of the Most High and Sword Hand of the Prophet. Ph.D. Princeton, SCB Massachusetts Institute of Technology, M.A. Oxford. To the Excellencies A.A. Mosegren, Premier President of the Union of Eastern European Soviet Republics, and Sung Li Yin. President of the United People's Republics of East Asia. Greetings in the name of Allah. For the past five years I have watched with growing concern the increasing tensions between your Excellency's respective governments, allegedly arising out of the so-called Kakum River question. 
It is my conviction that this Kakum River dispute is the utterly fraudulent device by which both governments hope to create a pretext for the invasion of India, each ostensibly to rescue the unhappy country from the repressity of the other. Your Excellencies must surely realize that this is a contingency which the government of the Kingdom of Afghanistan cannot and will not permit. It would mean nothing short of the national extinction of the Kingdom of Afghanistan and the enslavement of the Afghan people. Your Excellencies will recall that I discuss this matter most urgently on the occasions of my visits to your respective capitals of Moscow and Nanking. Your respective attitudes on those occasions has firmly convinced me that neither of your excellencies is by nature capable of adopting a rational or civilized attitude toward this question. It appears that neither of your excellencies has any intention of abandoning your present war of mutual threats and blackmail until forced to do so by some overt act on the part of one or the other of your excellencies' governments, which would result in physical war of pan-Asiatic scope and magnitude. I am further convinced that this deplorable situation arises out of the megalomaniac ambitions of the federal governments of the UEESR and the UPREA, respectively, and that the different peoples of what you unblushingly call your autonomous republics have no ambitions except, on rapidly diminishing order of probability, to live out their natural span of years in peace. Therefore, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, we, Sher Ali Abdallah, Amir of Afghanistan, etc., do decree and command that the political entities known as the Union of East European Soviet Republics and the United People's Republics of East Asia, respectively, are herewith abolished and dissolved into their constituent autonomous republics, each one of which shall hereafter enjoy complete sovereignty within its own borders as is right and proper. Now, in case either of you gentlemen feel inclined to laugh this off, let me remind you of the series of mysterious disappearances of some of the most noted scientists of both the UEESR and the UPREA, and let me advise your excellencies that these scientists are now residents and subjects of the Kingdom of Afghanistan, and are here engaged in research and development for my government. These gentlemen were not abducted, as you gentlemen seem to believe. They came here of their own free will, and as nothing better to remain here, while they are treated with dignity and honor given material rewards, riches, palaces, harems, retinues of servants, etc., and are also free from the intellectual and ideological restraints which make life so intolerable in your respective countries to any man above the order of intelligence of a cretin. In return for these benefactions, these eminent scientists have developed for my government certain weapons. For example, 1. A nuclear rocket-guided missile, officially designated as the Sword of Islam, vastly superior to Your Excellency's respective guided missiles, Marxist Victory and Celestial Destroyer. It should be. It was the product of the joint efforts of Dr. Voronov and Dr. Bao Hushin, whom Your Excellencies know. 2. A new type of radar radio electronic defense screen, which can not only detect the approach of a guided missile at any velocity whatsoever, but will automatically capture and redirect the same. In case either of Your Excellencies doubt this statement, you are invited to aim a rocket at some target in Afghanistan and see what happens. 3. Both the UPREA matured virus and the UEESR con contagious sterility with positive vaccines against the former and means of instrumental detection of the latter. 4. A technique for initiating and controlling the Beth carbon hydrogen cycle. We are now using this as a source of heat for industrial and even domestic purposes, and we also have a carbon-hydrogen cycle bomb. Such a bomb, delivered by one of our Sword of Islam Mark IVs, was activated yesterday over the northern tip of Nova Zembla, at an altitude of four miles. I am enclosing photographic reproductions of views of this test, televised to Kabul by an accompanying Sword of Islam Mark V observation rocket. I am informed that expeditions have been sent by both the UESR and the UPREA to investigate. They should find some very interesting conditions. For one thing, they won't need their climbing equipment to get over the Nova Zimba Glacier. The Nova Zimba Glacier isn't there anymore. 5. A lithium bomb. This has not been tested yet. A lithium bomb is nothing for a country the size of Afghanistan to let off inside its own borders. We intend making a test with it within the next 10 days. 
However, if your excellencies will designate a target which must be at the center of an uninhabited area at least 500 miles square, the test can be made in perfect safety. If not, I cannot answer the results. That would be in the hands of Allah, who has ordered all things. No doubt Allah has ordained the destruction of either Moscow or Nanking. Whichever city Allah has elected to erase, I will make it my personal responsibility to see to it that the other isn't slighted either. However, if your excellencies decide to accede to my modest and reasonable demands, not later than one week from today, this launching will be cancelled as unnecessary. Of course, this would leave unsettled a bet I have made with Dr. Hong Fu, a star sapphire against his favorite Persian concubine, that the explosion of a lithium bomb will not initiate a chain reaction in the Earth's crust and so disintegrate this planet. This, of course, is a minor consideration, unworthy of your notice. Of course, I am aware that both of your excellencies have, in the past, fomented mutual jealousies and suspicions among the several autonomous republics under your respective jurisdictions as an instrument of policy. If these people were, at the time, to receive full independence, the present inevitability of a pan-Asiatic war on a grand scale would be replaced only with the inevitability of a pan-Asiatic war by detail. Obviously, some single supranational sovereignty is needed to maintain peace, and such a sovereignty would be established under some leadership not hitherto associated with either the former UEESR or the former UPREA. I humbly offer myself as president of such a supranational organization, counting as a matter of course upon the wholehearted support and cooperation of both your excellencies. It might be well if both your excellencies were to come here to Kabul to confer with me on this subject at your very earliest convenience. The peace of Allah be upon your excellencies. Sher Ali Abdallah, PhD, SCBMA. From New York Times, October 30th, 1984. Mosergen, Sun Li Yin, fated at Kabul. Confer with Amir, discuss peace plans. Surprise developments seen. End of Operation RSVP by Henry Beam Piper. Recorded by William Hazeltine. Pandemic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Pandemic by J. F. Bone. Quote, Generally, human beings don't do totally useless things consistently and widely, so maybe there is something to it." Unquote. We call it Thurston's disease for two perfectly good reasons, Dr. Walter Kramer said. He discovered it, and he was the first to die of it. The doctor fumbled fruitlessly through the pockets of his lab coat. Now, where the devil did I put those matches? Are these what you're looking for? The trim blonde in the gray seersucker uniform asked. She picked a small box of wooden safety matches from the littered lab table beside her and handed them to him. Ah, Kramer said. Thanks. Things have a habit of getting lost around here. I can believe that she said, as she eyed the frenzied disorder around her. Her boss wasn't much better than his laboratory, she decided, as she watched him strike a match against the side of the box and apply the flame to the charred bowl of his pipe. His long, dark face became half-obscured behind a cloud of bluish smoke as he puffed furiously. He looked like a lean, untidy devil, recently escaped from hell, with his thick brows, green eyes, and lank black hair, highlighted intermittently by the leaping flame of the match. He certainly didn't look like a pathologist. She wondered if she was 
going to like working with him, and shook her head imperceptibly. Possibly, but not probably. It might be difficult being cooped up here with him day after day. Well, she could always quit if things got too tough. At least there was that consolation. He draped his lean body across a lab stool and leaned his elbows on its back. There was a faint smile on his face as he eyed her quizzically. You're new, he said. Not just to this lab, but uh, to the Institute. She nodded. I am. But how did you know? Thurston's disease. Everyone in the Institute knows that name for the plague, but few outsiders do. He smiled sardonically. Virus pneumonic plague. That's a better term for public use. After all, what good does it do to advertise a doctor's stupidity? She eyed him curiously. De mortuus? she asked. He nodded. That's about it. We may condemn our own, but we don't like laymen doing it. And besides, Thurston had good intentions. He never dreamed this would happen. The road to hell, so I hear, is paved with good intentions. Undoubtedly, Kramer said dryly. Incidentally, did you apply for this job or were you assigned? I applied. Someone should have warned you I dislike clichés, he said. He paused a moment and eyed her curiously. Just why did you apply? he asked. Why are you imprisoning yourself in a sealed laboratory which you won't leave as long as you work here? You know, of course, what the conditions are. Unless you resign or are carried out feet first, you will remain here. Have you considered what such an imprisonment means? I considered it, and it doesn't make any difference. I have no ties outside, and I thought I could help. I've had training. I was a nurse before I was married. Divorced? Widowed. Kramer nodded. There were plenty of widows and widowers outside. Too many. But it wasn't much worse than in the Institute where, despite precautions, Thurston's disease took its toll of life. Did they tell you this place is called the Suicide Section? he asked. She nodded. Weren't you frightened? Of dying? Hardly. Too many people are doing it nowadays. He grimaced, looking more satanic than ever. You have a point, he admitted, but it isn't a good one. <sighs> Young people should be afraid of dying. You're not. I'm not young. I'm 35, and besides, this is my business. I've been looking at death for 11 years. I'm immune. I haven't your experience, she admitted, but I have your attitude. What's your name? Kramer said. Barton. Mary Barton. Hmm. Well, Mary, I can't turn you down. I need you, but I could wish you had taken some other job. I'll survive. He looked at her with faint admiration in his greenish eyes. Perhaps you will, he said. All right. As to your duties, you will be my assistant, which means you'll be a dishwasher, laboratory technician, secretary, junior pathologist, and coffee maker. I'll help you with all the jobs except the last one. I make lousy coffee. Kramer grinned, his teeth a white flash across the darkness of his face. You'll be on call 24 hours a day, underpaid, overworked, and in constant danger until we lick Thurston's virus. You'll be expected to handle the jobs of three people, unless I can get more help, and I doubt that I can. People stay away from here in droves. There's no future in it. Mary smiled wryly. 
Literally or figuratively? she asked. He chuckled. You have a nice sense of graveyard humor, he said. It'll help, but don't get careless. Assistants are hard to find. She shook her head. I won't. While I'm not afraid of dying, I don't want to do it. And I have no illusions about the danger. I was briefed quite thoroughly. They wanted you to work upstairs. She nodded. I suppose they need help, too. Thurston's disease has riddled the medical profession. Just don't forget that this place can be a death trap. One mistake, and you've had it. Naturally, we take every precaution. But with a virus, no protection is absolute. If you're careless and make errors in procedure, sooner or later one of those sub-microscopic protein molecules will get into your system. You're still alive? So I am, Kramer said, but I don't take chances. My predecessor, my secretary, my lab technician, my junior pathologist, and my dishwasher all died of Thurston's disease. He eyed her grimly. Still want the job? He asked. I lost a husband and a three-year-old son, Mary said with equal grimness. That's why I'm here. I want to destroy the thing that killed my family. I want to do something. I want to be useful. He nodded. I think you can be, he said quietly. Mind if I smoke? She asked. I need some defense against that pipe of yours. No, go ahead. Out here it's all right, but not in the security section. Mary took a package of cigarettes from her pocket, lit one, and blew a cloud of gray smoke to mingle with the blue haze from Kramer's pipe. Comfortable? Kramer asked. She nodded. He looked at his wristwatch. We have half an hour before the roll tube cultures are ready for examination. That should be enough to tell you about the modern Pasteur and his mutant virus. Since your duties will primarily involve Thurston's disease, you'd better know something about it. He settled himself more comfortably across the lab bench and went on talking in a dry, schoolmasterish voice. Alan Thurston was an immunologist at Midwestern University Medical School. Like most men in the teaching trade, he also had a research project. If it worked out, he'd be one of the great names in medicine like Jenner, Pasteur, and Salk. The result was that he pushed it and wasn't too careful. He wanted to be famous. Well, he's well known now, Mary said, at least within the profession. Quite, Kramer said dryly. He was working with gamma radiations on microorganisms, trying to produce a mutated strain of Micrococcus piogenes that would have enhanced antigenic properties. Wait a minute, doctor. It's been four years since I was active in nursing. Translation, please. Kramer chuckled. <laughs> he was trying to make a vaccine out of a common infectious organism. You may know it better as Staphylococcus. As you know, it's a pus former that made hospital life more dangerous than it should be because it develops a resistance to antibiotics. What Thurston wanted to do was to produce a strain that would stimulate resistance in the patient without causing disease, something that would help patients protect themselves rather than rely upon doubtfully effective antibiotics. That wasn't a bad idea. There was nothing wrong with it. The only trouble was that he wound up with something else entirely. He was like the man who wanted to make a plastic suitable for children's toys and ended up with a new explosive. You see, what Thurston didn't realize was that his cultures were contaminated. He'd secured them from the university clinic and had, so he thought, isolated them. But somehow he'd brought a virus along, probably one of the orphan group, 
or possibly a phage. Orphan? Yes. One that was not a normal inhabitant of human tissues. At any rate, there was a virus, and he mutated it rather than the bacteria. Actually, it was simple enough, relatively speaking, since a virus is infinitely simpler in structure than a bacterium, and hence much easier to modify with ionizing radiation. So, he didn't produce an antigen, he produced a disease instead. Naturally, he contracted it, and during the period between his infection and death, he managed to infect the entire hospital. Before anyone realized what they were dealing with, the disease jumped from the hospital to the college, and from the college to the city, and from the city to... Yes, I know that part of it. It's all over the world now, killing people by the millions. Well, Kramer said, at least it solved the population explosion. He blew a cloud of blue smoke in Mary's direction. And it did make Thurston famous. His name won't be quickly forgotten. She coughed. <laughs> I doubt if it ever will be, she said, but it won't be remembered the way he intended. He looked at her suspiciously. That cough. No, it's not Thurston's disease. It's that pipe. It's rancid. It helps me think. Kramer said. You could try cigarettes or candy, she suggested. I'd rather smoke a pipe. There's cancer of the lip and tongue, she said helpfully. Don't quote Oxner. I don't agree with him. And besides, you smoke cigarettes, which are infinitely worse. Only four or five a day. I don't saturate my system with nicotine. In another generation, Kramer observed, you'd have run through the streets of the city, brandishing an axe, smashing saloons. You're a lineal descendant of Carry Nation. He puffed quietly until his head was surrounded by a nimbus of smoke. Stop trying to reform me, he added. You haven't been here long enough. Not even God could do that, according to the reports I've heard, she said. He laughed. <laughs> I suppose my reputation gets around. It does. You're an opinionated slave driver, a bully, an intellectual tyrant, and the best pathologist in this center. The last part of that sentence makes up for unflattering honesty of the first, Kramer said. At any rate, once we realized the situation, we went to work to correct it. Institutes like this were established everywhere the disease appeared for the sole purpose of examining, treating, and experimenting with the hope of finding a cure. This section exists for the evaluation of treatment. We checked the human cases and the primates in the experimental laboratories. It is our duty to find out if anything the boys upstairs try shows any promise. We were a pretty big section once. But Thurston's virus has whittled us down. Right now there's just you and me, but there's still enough work to keep us busy. The experiments are still going on, and there are still human cases, even though the virus has killed off most of the susceptibles. We've evaluated over a thousand different drugs and treatments in this institute alone. And none of them have worked? No. But that doesn't mean the work's been useless. The research has saved others thousands of man-hours chasing false leads. In this business, negative results are almost as important as positive ones. We may never discover the solution, but our work will keep others from making the same mistakes. I never thought of that that way. People seldom do. But if you realize that this is international, that every worker on Thurston's disease has a niche to fill, the picture will be clearer. We're doing our part inside the plan. Others are too, and there are thousands of labs involved. Somewhere, 
someone will find the answer. It probably won't be us, but we'll help get the problem solved as quickly as possible. That's the important thing. It's the biggest challenge the race has ever faced, and the most important. It's a question of survival. Kramer's voice was sober. We have to solve this. If Thurston's disease isn't checked, the human race will become extinct. As a result, for the first time in history, all mankind is working together. All? You mean the communists are too? Of course. What's an ideology if there are no people to follow it? Kramer knocked the ashes out of his pipe and looked at the laboratory clock and shrugged. Ten minutes more, he said, and these tubes will be ready. Keep an eye on that clock and let me know. Meantime, you can straighten up this lab and find out where things are. I'll be in the office checking the progress reports. He turned abruptly away, leaving her standing in the middle of the cluttered laboratory. Now, what am I supposed to do here? Mary wondered aloud. Clean up, he says. Find out where things are, he says. Get acquainted with the place, he says. I could spend a month doing that. She looked at the littered bench, the wall cabinets with sliding doors half open, the jars of reagents sitting on the sink, the drain board on top of the refrigerator and on the floor. The disorder was appalling. How he ever manages to work in here is beyond me. I suppose that I'd better start somewhere. Perhaps I can get these bottles in some sort of order first. She sighed and moved toward the wall cabinets. Oh, well, she mused. I asked for this. Didn't you hear that buzzer? Kramer asked. Was that for me? Mary said, looking up from a pile of bottles and glassware she was sorting. Partly. It means that they've sent us another post-mortem from upstairs. What is it? I don't know. Man or monkey? It makes no difference. Whatever it is, it's Thurston's disease. Come along. You might as well see what goes on in our ultra-modern necropsy suit. I'd like to. She put down the bottle she was holding and followed him to a green door at the rear of the laboratory. Inside, Kramer said, you will find a small anteroom, a shower, and a dressing room. Strip shower and put on a clean set of lab coveralls and slippers which you'll we'll find in the dressing room you'll find surgical masks in the wall cabinet besides the lockers go through the door beyond the dressing room and wait for me there i'll give you ten minutes we can do this both ways kramer said as he joined her in the narrow hall beyond the dressing room. We'll reverse the process going out. You certainly carry security to a maximum, she said through the mask that covered the lower part of her face. You haven't seen anything yet, he said as he opened a door in the hall. Note the positive air pressure, he said. Theoretically, nothing can get in here except what we bring with us and we try not to bring anything. He stood aside to show her the glassed-in cubicle overhanging a bare room dominated by a polished steel post-mortem table that glittered in the harsh fluorescent lighting. Above the table, a number of jointed rods and clamps hung from the ceiling. A low metal door and a series of racks containing instruments and glassware were set into the opposite wall together with the gaping circular orifice of an open autoclave. We work by remote control, just like they do at the AEC. See those handlers? He pointed to the control console set into a small stainless steel table standing beside the sheet of glass at the far end of the cubicle. They're connected to those gadgets up there. He indicated the jointed arms hanging over the autopsy table in the room beyond. 
I could perform a major operation from here and never touch the patient. Using these, I can do anything I could in person, with the difference that there's a quarter inch of glass between me and my work. I have controls that let me use magnifiers, and even do micro-dissection if necessary. Where's the cadaver? Mary asked. Across the room, behind that door, he said, waving it at the low, sliding metal partition behind the table. It's been prepped, decontaminated, and ready to go. What happens when you're through? Watch. Dr. Kramer pressed a button on the console in front of him. A section of flooring slid aside, and the table tipped. The cadaver slides off that table and through that hole. Down below is a highly efficient crematorium. Mary shivered. Neat and effective, she said shakily. After that, the whole room is sprayed with germicide and sterilized with live steam. The instruments go into the autoclave, and thirty minutes later we're ready for another post-mortem. We use the handlers to put specimens into those jars, he said, pointing to a row of capped glass jars of assorted sizes on a wall rack behind the table. After they're capped, the jars go on to that carrier beside the table. From here they pass through a decontamination chamber and into the remote control laboratory across the hall, where we can run biochemical and histological techniques. Finished slides and mounted specimens then go through another decontamination process to the outside lab. Theoretically, this place is proof against anything. It seems to be, Mary said, obviously impressed. I've never seen anything so elegant. Neither did I until Thurston's disease became a problem. Kramer shrugged and sat down behind the controls. Watch now he said, as he pressed a button. Let's see what's on deck, man or monkey. Want to make a bet? I'll give you two to one. It's a monkey. She shook her head. The low door slid aside, and a steel carriage emerged into the necropsy room, bearing the nude body of a man. The corpse gleamed pallidly under the harsh, shadowless glare of the fluorescence in the ceiling as Kramer using the handlers, rolled it onto the post-mortem table and clamped it in place on its back. He pushed another button, and the carriage moved back into the wall, and the steel door slid shut. That'll be decontaminated, he said, and sent back upstairs for another body. I'd have lost, he remarked idly. Lately the posts have been running three to one in favor of monkeys. He moved a handler and picked up a heavy scalpel from the instrument rack. There's a certain advantage to this, he said, as he moved the handler delicately. These gadgets give a tremendous mechanical advantage. I can cut right through small bones and cartilage without using a saw. How nice, Mary said. I expect you enjoy yourself. I couldn't ask for better equipment, he replied noncommittally. With deaf motion of the handler, he drew the scalpel down across the chest and along the costal margins in the classic inverted Y incision. We'll take a look at the thorax first, he said, as he used the handlers to pry open the rib cage and expose the thoracic viscera. Ah, thought so. See that? He pointed with a small handler that carried a probe. Look at those lungs. He swung a viewer into place so Mary could see better. Look at those abscesses and necrosis. It's Thurston's disease, all right, with secondary bacterial invasion. The grayish, solidified masses of tissue look nothing like the normal pink appearance of healthy lungs. Studded with yellowish, spherical abscesses, they lay swollen and engorged within the gaping cavity of the chest. You know the pathogenesis of Thurston's disease? Kramer asked. 
Mary shook her head, her face yellowish-white in the glare of the fluorescence. It begins with a bronchial cough, Kramer said. The virus attacks the bronchioles first, destroys them, and passes into the deeper tissues of the lungs. As with most virus disease, there is a transitory leukopenia, a drop in the total number of white blood cells, and a rise in temperature of about two or three degrees. As the virus attacks the alveolar structures, the temperature rises and the white blood cell count becomes elevated. The lungs become inflamed and painful. There is a considerable quantity of lymphoid exudate and pleural effusion. Secondary invaders and pus-forming bacteria follow the viral destruction of the lung tissue and form abscesses. Breathing becomes progressively more difficult as more lung tissue is destroyed. Hepatization and necrosis inactivate more lung tissue as the bacteria get in their dirty work, and finally the patient suffocates. But what if the bacteria are controlled by antibiotics? Then the virus does the job. It produces atelectasis followed by progressive necrosis of lung tissue with gradual liquefaction of the parenchyma. It's slower, but just as fatal. This fellow was lucky. He apparently stayed out of here until he was almost dead. Probably he's had the disease for about a week. If he'd come in early, we could have kept him alive for maybe a month. The end, however, would have been the same. It's a terrible thing, Mary said faintly. You'll get used to it. We get one or two every day. He shrugged. There's nothing here that's interesting, he said, as he released the clamps and tilted the table. For what seemed to Mary an interminable time, the cadaver clung to the polished steel. Then abruptly it slid off the shining surface and disappeared through the square hole in the floor. We'll clean up now. Kramer said, as he placed the instruments in the autoclave, closed the door and locked it, and pressed three buttons on the console. From jets embedded in the walls, a fine spray filled the room with fog. Germicide, Kramer said. Later there'll be steam. That's all for now. Do you want to go? Mary nodded. If you feel a little rocky, there's a bottle of scotch in my desk. I'll split a drink with you when we get out of here. Thanks, Mary said. I think I can use one. Barton? Where is the McNeil stain? Kramer's voice came from the lab. I left it on the sink, and it's gone. It's right with the other blood stains and reagents. Second drawer from the right in the big cabinet. There's a label on the drawer, Mary called from the office. If you can wait until I finish filing these papers, I'll come and help you. I wish you would, Kramer's voice was faintly exasperated. Ever since you've organized my lab, I can't find anything. You just have a disorderly mind, Mary said as she slipped the last paper into its proper folder and closed the file. I'll be with you in a minute. I don't dare lose you. Kramer said as Mary came into the lab. You've made yourself indispensable. It'd take me six months to undo what you've done in one. Not that I mind, he amended, but I was used to things the way they were. He looked around the orderly laboratory with a mixture of pride and annoyance. Things are so neat, they're almost painful. You look more like a pathologist should. Mary said as she deftly removed the tray of blood slides from in front of him and began to run the stains. It's my job to keep you free to think. Whose brilliant idea is that? Yours? No, the director's. He told me what my duties were when I came here, and I think he's right. You should be using your brain rather than fooling around with blood stains and sectioning tissues. 
But I like doing things like that, Kramer protested. It's relaxing. What right have you to relax? Mary said. Outside people are dying by the thousands, and you want to relax. Have you looked at the latest mortality reports? No. You should. The WHO estimates that nearly two billion people have died since Thurston's disease first appeared in epidemic proportions. That's two out of three. And more are dying every day. Yet you want to relax. I know, Kramer said. But what can we do about it? We're working, but we're getting no results. You might use that brain of yours. Mary said bitterly. You're supposed to be a scientist. You have facts. Can't you put them together? I don't know, he shrugged. I've been working on this problem longer than you think. I come down here at night. I know. I clean up after you. I haven't gotten anywhere. Sure, we can isolate the virus. It grows nicely on monkey lung cells, but that doesn't help. The thing has no apparent antigenicity. It parasitizes, but it doesn't trigger any immune reaction. We can kill it, but the strength of the germicide is too great for living tissue to tolerate. Some people seem to be immune. Sure they do, but why? Don't ask me. I'm not the scientist. Play like one, Kramer growled. Here are the facts. The disease attacks people of all races and ages. So far, everyone who is attacked dies. Adult Europeans and Americans appear to be somewhat more resistant than others on a population basis. Somewhere around 60% of them are still alive, but it's wiped out better than 80% of some groups. Children get it worse. Right now, I doubt if 1% of the children born during the past 10 years are still alive. It's awful, Mary said. It's worse than that. It's extinction. Without kids, the race will die out. Kramer rubbed his forehead. Have you any ideas? Children have less resistance, Kramer replied. An adult gets exposed to a number of diseases to which he builds an immunity. Possibly one of these has a cross immunity against Thurston's virus. Then why don't you work on that line? Mary asked. Just what do you think I've been doing? That idea was put out months ago, and everyone has been taking a crack at it. There are 24 laboratories working full-time on that facet, and God knows how many more working part-time like we are. I've screened a dozen common diseases, including the six varieties of the common cold virus. All, incidentally, were negative. Well, are you going to keep on with it? I have to. Kramer rubbed his eyes. It won't let me sleep. I'm sure we're on the right track. Something an adult gets gives him resistance or immunity. He shrugged. Tell you what, you run those bloods out and I'll go take another look at the data. He reached into his lab coat and produced a pipe. I'll give it another try. Sometimes I wish you'd read without puffing on that thing, Mary said. Your delicate nose will be the death of me yet, Kramer said. It's my lungs I'm worried about, Mary said. They'll probably look like two pieces of well-tanned leather if I associate with you for another year. Stop complaining. You've gotten me to wear clean lab coats. Be satisfied with a limited victory, Kramer said absently his eyes staring unseeing at a row of reagent bottles on the bench. Abruptly, he nodded. Fantastic, he muttered, but it's worth a check. He left the room, slamming the door behind him in his hurry. That man, Mary murmured. 
He drove a saint out of his mind. If I wasn't so fond of him, I'd quit. If anyone told me I'd fall in love with a pathologist, I'd have said they were crazy. I wish... Whatever the wish was, it wasn't uttered. Mary gasped and coughed rackingly. Carefully, she moved back from the bench, opened a drawer, and found a thermometer. She put it in her mouth. Then she drew a drop of blood from her forefinger and filled a red and white cell pipette and made a smear of the remainder. She was interrupted by another spasm of coughing, but she waited until the paroxysm passed and went methodically back to her self-appointed task. She had done this many times before. It was a routine procedure to check on anything that might be Thurston's disease. A cold, a sore throat, a slight difficulty in breathing, all demanded the diagnostic check. It was as much a habit as breathing. This was probably the result of that cold she'd gotten last week, but there was nothing like being sure. Now let's see. Temperature, 99.5 degrees. Red cell count, 4.5 million. White cell count, oh, 2,500. Leukopenia. The differentials showed a virtual absence of polymorphs, lymphocytes, and monocytes. The whole slide didn't have 200. Eosinophils and basophils, way up, 20 and 15 percent respectively, a relative rise rather than an absolute one. Leukopenia. No doubt about it. She shrugged. <laughs> There wasn't much question. She had Thurston's disease. It was the beginning stages, the harsh cough, the slight temperature, the leukopenia. Pretty soon her white cell count would begin to rise, but it would rise too late. In fact, it was already too late. It's funny, she thought. I'm going to die, but it doesn't frighten me. In fact, the only thing that bothers me is that poor Walter is going to have a terrible time finding things. But I can't put this place the way it was. I couldn't hope to. She shook her head, slid gingerly off the lab stool, and went to the hall door. She'd better check in at the clinic, she thought. There was bed space in the hospital now. Plenty of it. That hadn't been true a few months ago. But the only ones who were dying now were the newborn and an occasional adult like herself. The epidemic had died out not because of lack of virulence, but because of lack of victims. The city outside, one of the first affected, now had less than 40% of its people left alive. It was a hollow shell of its former self. People walked its streets and went through the motions of life, but they were not really alive. The vital criteria were as necessary for a race as for an individual. Growth, reproduction, irritability, metabolism. Mary smiled wryly. Whoever authored that hackneyed mnemonic that life was a grim proposition never knew how right he was particularly when one of the criteria was missing. The race couldn't reproduce. That was the true horror of Thurston's disease. Not how it killed, but who it killed. No children played in the parks and playgrounds. The schools were empty. No babies were pushed in carriages or taken on tours through supermarkets and shopping carts. No advertisements of motherhood or children, or children's things, were in the newspapers or magazines. They were forbidden subjects, too dangerously emotional to touch. Laughter and shrill young voices had vanished from the earth to be replaced by the drab grayness of silence and waiting. Death had laid cold hands upon the hearts of mankind, and the survivors were frozen to numbness. It was odd, she thought, how wrong the prophets were. When Thurston's disease broke into the news, there were frightened predictions of the end of civilization. But they had not materialized. There were no mass insurrections, no rioting, no organized violence. 
Individual excesses, yes, but nothing of a group nature. What little panic there was at the beginning disappeared once people realized that there was no place to go, and a grim passivity had settled upon the survivors. Civilization did not break down. It endured. The mechanics remained intact. People had to do something, even if it was only routine, counterfeit of normal life, the stiff upper lip in the face of disaster. It would have been far more odd, Mary decided, if mankind had given way to panic. Humanity had survived other plagues nearly as terrible as this, and racial memory is long. The same grim patience of the past was here in the present. Man would somehow survive, and civilization go on. It was inconceivable that mankind would become extinct. The whole vast resources and pooled intelligence of surviving humanity were focused upon Thurston's disease. And the disease would yield. Humanity waited with childlike confidence for the miracle that would save it. And the miracle would happen. Mary knew it with a calm certainty as she stood in the cross corridor at the end of the hall looking down the thirty yards of tile that separated her from the elevator that would carry her up to the clinic and oblivion. It might be too late for her, but not for the race. Nature had tried unaided to destroy man before, and had failed, and her unholy alliance with man's genius would also fail. She wondered as she walked down the corridor if the others who had sickened and died felt as she did. She speculated with grim amusement whether Walter Kramer would be as impersonal as he was with the others when he performed the post-mortem on her body. She shivered at the thought of that bare, sterile room and the shining table. Death was not a pretty thing, but she could meet it with resignation, if not with courage. She had already seen too much for it to have any meaning. She did not falter as she placed a finger on the elevator button. Poor Walter, she sighed. Sometimes it was harder to be among the living. It was good that she didn't let him know how she felt. She had sensed a change in him recently. His friendly impersonality had become merely friendly. It could, with a little encouragement, have developed into something else. But it wouldn't now. She sighed again. His hardness had been a tower of strength, and his bitter gallows humor had furnished a wry relief to grim reality. It had been nice to work with him. She wondered if he would miss her. Her lips curled in a faint smile. He would, if only for the trouble he would have in making chaos out of the order she had created. Why couldn't that elevator hurry? Mary! Where are you going? Kramer's voice was in her ears, and his hand was on her shoulder. Don't touch me. Why not? His voice was curiously different, younger, excited. I have, I have Thurston's disease, she said. He didn't let go. Are you sure? The presumptive tests were positive. Initial stages? She nodded. I had the first coughing attack a few minutes ago. He pulled her away from the elevator door that suddenly slid open. You are going to that death trap upstairs, he said. Where else can I go? With me, he said. I think I can help you. How? Have you found a cure for the virus? I think so. At least it's a better possibility than the things they're using up there. His voice was urgent. And to think I might never have seen it if you hadn't put me on the track. Are you sure you're right? Not absolutely, but the facts fit. The theory's good. <sighs> then I'm going to the clinic. I can't risk infecting you. I'm a carrier now. I can kill you, and you're too important to die. You don't know how wrong you are. Kramer said. 
Let go of me. No, you're coming back. She twisted in his grasp. Let me go, she sobbed, and broke into a fit of coughing worse than before. What I was trying to say, Dr. Kramer said into the silence that followed, is that you have Thurston's disease. You've been a carrier for at least two weeks. If I am going to get it, you're going away can't help. If, And if I'm not, I'm not. Do you come willingly, or shall I knock you unconscious and drag you back? Kramer asked. She looked at his face. It was grimmer than she had ever seen it before. Numbly, she let him lead her back to the laboratory. But Walter, I can't. That's sixty in the past ten hours, she protested. Take it, he said grimly. Then take another, and inhale, deeply. But they make me dizzy. Better dizzy than dead. And by the way, how's your chest? Better. There's no pain now. But the cough is worse. It should be. Why? You've never smoked enough to get a cigarette cough, he said. She shook her head dizzily. You're so right, she said. And that's what nearly killed you, he finished triumphantly. Are you sure? I'm certain. Naturally, I can't prove it, yet. But that's just a matter of time. Your response just about clenches it. Take a look at the records. Who gets this disease? Youngsters with nearly 100% morbidity and 100% mortality. Adults, less than 50% morbidity, and again, 100% mortality. What makes the other 50% immune? Your crack about leather lungs started me thinking, so I fed the data cards into the computer and keyed them for smoking versus incidents. And I found that not one heavy smoker had died of Thurston's disease. Light smokers and non-smokers, plenty of them, but not one single nicotine addict. And there were over 10,000 randomized cards in that spot check. And there's the exact reverse of that classic experiment the lung cancer boys used to sell their case. Among certain religious groups, which prohibit smoking, there was nearly 100% mortality of all ages. And so I thought, since the disease was just starting in you, perhaps I could stop it if I loaded you with tobacco smoke. And it works. You're not certain yet, Mary said. I might not have the disease. You had the symptoms, and there's virus in your sputum. Yes, but... But nothing. I passed the word, and the boys in the other labs figure that there's merit in it. We're going to call it Barton's therapy in your honor. It's going to cause a minor social revolution. A lot of laws are going to have to be rewritten. I can see where it's going to be illegal for children not to smoke. Funny, isn't it? I've contacted the maternity ward. They have three babies still alive upstairs. We get all the newborn in this town, or didn't you know? Funny, isn't it, how we still try to reproduce? They're rigging a smoke chamber for the kids. The head nurse is screaming like a wounded tiger, but she'll feel better with live babies to care for. The only bad thing I can see is that it may cut down on her chain smoking. She's been worried a lot about infant mortality. And speaking of nurseries, that reminds me. I wanted to ask you something. Yes? Will you marry me? I've wanted to ask you before, but I didn't dare. Now I think you owe me something. Your life. And I'd like to take care of it from now on. Of course I will, Mary said. And I have reasons, too. If I marry you, you can't possibly do that silly thing you plan. What thing? Naming the treatment... Barton's. It'll have to be Kramer's. 
End of Pandemic by J. F. Bone The Professional Approach This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joelle Peebles The Professional Approach by Charles Leonard Harness and Theodore Lockhart Thomas Quote, The trials of a patent lawyer are usually highly technical tribulations, and among the greatest is the fact that inventors are only slightly less predictable than their inventions. Unquote. Sometimes, said Helix Spartleton, Esquire, a patent case gets away from you. As the attorney in the case, you never quite see it the same as everybody else. You stand isolated and alone, unable to persuade the patent examiners, the board, the courts, possibly even the inventor, to accept your view of the case. Nothing you do or say matches anyone else's thinking, and you begin to wonder what's the matter with everyone. I nodded. This was my favorite time of day. It was early evening in Washington, D.C., and my boss, Helix Spartleton, patent attorney extraordinary, was relaxing. His feet were up on one corner of his desk, his cigar was in the contemplation position, and the smoke curled slowly toward the ceiling. His office was a good room in which to relax. It was filled with fine, old, well-scratched furniture, and the walls were lined with books and there was the comfortable picture of Justice Holmes on the wall looking down with rare approval on what he saw. Susan, our secretary, had made the last coffee of the day, and had kicked off her shoes the better to enjoy it. The three of us just sat in the deepening dusk and talked. We didn't even turn on a light. It was a shame I wasn't paying close attention to Mr. Spartleton. I said, Yes, I know what you mean about other people's not seeing things the same way you do. I've seen something like it at work with some of my friends just before they get married. They think their brides are just about the most beautiful women in the world, when they are really quite homely. Wouldn't even hold a candle to our Susan here. Mr. Spartleton looked at me, and then at Susan, and Susan looked at him, and then at me, in that sober, wide-eyed way she has. And then they looked at each other and smiled. I guess they realized that I had said something pretty funny. Mr. Spartleton said, I understand why you think of the situation in terms of brides, but I always think of it in terms of a proud father who sees nothing but perfection in his newborn son. Yes, I said, that's a good way to put it, too. There are, he continued through a cloud of gentle smoke, two different ways in which patent case can get away from the attorney. The first doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it has a tendency to set the world on fire. That's the case that has true merit to it, high invention, if you will, but the invention is so subtle that nobody can see its importance. Only the attorney who wraps the case around his heart can appreciate its vast potential. He goes through the prosecution before the patent office and possibly before the courts, shouting high praises of the invention. But all the tribunals turn a deaf ear. Sometimes the attorney finally reaches nirvana. The invention comes into its own. It shakes the world, just as the attorney had always known it would. I nodded and said, Elias Howe and his sewing machine, McCormick and his reaper, Colt and his pistol. Mr. Spartleton had taught me well. The other way is more common, he continued. There the attorney never sees the case in its true light. He is blinded by something in it and thinks it is greater than it is. He wastes a lot of time trying to persuade everybody that this very ordinary invention is the wonder of the decade. He thinks of the invention the way a father does of a wayward son. He sees none of its faults, only its virtues, and he magnifies those. I shifted into a more comfortable position in my deep chair. Mr. Spartleton must have thought I was going to say something. He looked at me and added hastily, or rather, as you'd have it, the way a bridegroom looks at his prospective bride, that better? Oh, yes, those fellows are really blinded. They just can't see anything the way it really is. Mr. Spartleton said, most patent attorneys are unable to tell the difference between the two ways a case can get away from them. Once they get caught in it, they always think that nobody else agrees with them, because nobody else understands the case. It is quite a blow when it turns out that they are the only one who has been wrong all along. Yes, sometimes an understanding of the facts is as difficult as an understanding of the law. Yes, I said sleepily, sure must be. 
If I had known better that evening, I would never have allowed myself to get so sleepy. I should have listened for the meaning in Mr. Sparleton's words instead of merely listening to the words themselves. I have seen patent examiners act that way. They hear the words, but the meaning does not come through. We locked the doors and went home then. How I wish I had listened. Dr. Nathaniel Marcher is unquestionably the greatest organic chemist the world has seen since Emil Fisher. His laboratories in Alexandria, Virginia, constantly pour out a host of exceedingly important inventions. The chemists, physicists, physical chemists, and biologists who work under him are all dedicated men and women, gifted with that scientific insight that so often produces simple solutions to great problems. Dr. Marcher and his people are the principal clients of the firm of Helix Spartleton, patent attorney, and as such they are very important to me. Nevertheless, I always get a queasy feeling in my stomach when Dr. Marcher excitedly calls up Mr. Spartleton, and Mr. Spartleton turns him over to me. Dr. Marcher is a very nice person, not at all mad as people are prone to say. He is tall and gaunt and slightly wall-eyed, and he seems to live in a great flopping laboratory smock, and his hair is always wild, and he seems to look around you rather than at you, but he is a very nice person and not at all mad. His main trouble is he does not understand the workings of the United States patent system. After I have explained to him the operation of the patent law on some particular situation, Dr. Marcher frequently begins to mutter to himself as if I were no longer in the same room with him, and I find this most discouraging. As if this were not bad enough, many of Dr. Marcher's scientists have acquired the same habit. It was a bright fall morning when this particular call came through. I hadn't heard the phone ring, nor did I hear Mr. Spartleton answer it in response to Susan's buzz, but some sixth sense brought me upright in my chair when I heard Mr. Spartleton say, "'Well, how are things out in the Washington suburbs this morning?' I felt the hairs tingle at the base of my neck, and I knew that Mr. Spartleton was talking to Dr. Marcher. I heard, "'Certainly, why don't I send Mr. Saddle out?' He's worked with Callahan before, on that pigeon scare case, as I recall, and the two of them can decide what to do. That sound all right? I'm afraid it sounded all right, because there was some chit-chat, and then the sound of the phones banging into its cradle, and Mr. Spartleton's booming voice. Oh, Mr. Saddle, will you come in here a moment, please? I took a quick swallow of milk of magnesia, an excellent antacid, and went in. Mr. Spartleton was busy, so he came right to the point. They've got some kind of problem out at the Marcher laboratory. Don't know whether to file a patent application right now or wait until the invention is more fully developed. Will you hop out there and get them straightened out? Callahan is the chemist, and you know him pretty well. I certainly did. Callahan's name always reminded me of the time I took testimony in Sing Sing Prison on a Callahan application in interference. But I nodded numbly and went back to my office and finished the bottle of milk of magnesia and caught a cab to the Marcher laboratory. It was cool in the lab, and the air smelled faintly of solvents. I liked the smell, and I sniffed it deeply and tried to distinguish one from the other. My chemistry professor had often told me that I had the best nose he had run across in twenty-five years of teaching. I picked out the pungent aromatic odor of toluene and the hospital smell of diethyl ether and I thought I could detect the heavy odor of laurel alcohol. Underneath them all was a rich sweet smell that I had smelled before, but I couldn't tell what it was. I decided it was lactone, and I'd let it go at that. I nodded as I went past the receptionist, and her smile made me feel uncomfortable again, just as it always did. There was too much of a leer in it. I never stopped to tell her where I was going. I just went in unannounced. I went up the stairs and down the hall to Callahan's lab, next to Dr. Marcher's. I went in. Henry Callahan stood at a bench pouring a colorless liquid down a chromatographic column. He looked over at me and said, Well, Carl Saddle, how are you, man? Nice to see you. Callahan was a big man, heavy set with bright blue eyes and a shock of light brown hair. For all his bulk, he moved lightly as befitted a former stroke on the pen crew. I was fond of Callahan even with all the trouble his inventions caused me. I knew he couldn't help it. I said, Hello, Henry. How have you been? And we exchanged some more amenities. Finally, he said, Carl, we have quite a problem here, and we don't know what to do about it. Here's the situation. I swallowed and took out my notebook and pencil and laid my pocket slide rule in front of me. 
I always put the slide rule out where the inventor can see it to remind him that he is talking to another technical man, not just a lawyer. This helps make him stick to the facts. I don't need the rule with Callahan, but habit is hard to break. Callahan said, Some time ago I made a polyester, used a dipic acid and amino alcohol. On a hunch I dropped in an aluminum alkyl and pushed the polymerization along with both ultraviolet and heat. Got a stiff gel out of the pot and drew it into a quarter of a pound of fibers. I only had time to determine that the fibers were amorphous, no time to draw them further to see if they would develop crystallinity. I put them in an open mouth jar, which I later found had been used to store mercury. One evening I took them out and found they had developed crystallinity on standing. Furthermore, the fibrous ends had split, and the split ends seemed to be tacky, seemed unnatural to me to make a sheet of paper out of it. I nodded as I worked furiously on my notes. All of Marcher's people talked that way. They did the most fantastic things sometimes, and then talked about them as if anyone would have done the same thing. I had complained about this oddity to Mr. Spartleton when I first came to work for him. I was used to inventions that were made in understandable ways. He had smiled and asked me to quote the last sentence of 35 U.S.C. 103, the statute that set forth the conditions for patentability. It was a good thing I had memorized the statute. I recited the last sentence, Patentability shall not be negatived by the manner in which the invention is made. Well, here it was again. I asked Callahan, Did you make a sheet of paper out of it? Sure did. Made a hand sheet in a 12 by 12 inch mold. Pressed it out, dried it, then got busy again so I could test it for a week. When I did, I started working nights to see if I could duplicate my results. Just finished this morning. Here's the hand sheet, the second one. He handed me a sheet of paper, snow white in color. I put aside my pencil and notebook to examine it. As I took it in my hand, it was obvious that it was something unusual. It was softer than a cleansing tissue and probably even more flexible. I rubbed it between my fingers and it had the most remarkable feel of any paper I had ever felt, soft and clinging and cool and exceedingly pleasant. I knew the paper chemists call this property hand. Callahan's paper had the most remarkable hand I had ever seen. Tear it in half, Callahan said. I took the sheet between my thumbs and forefingers and gingerly pulled, expecting the light and soft sheet to part easily. Nothing happened. I pulled harder, and still nothing. I smiled at Callahan, got a better grip, and gave it a yank. Then I twisted opposite corners around my fingers and frankly pulled at it. The absurd sheet refused to tear, and I realized how ridiculous I must look to Callahan to be unable to tear a flimsy sheet of paper. I suppose I lost my temper a little. I gathered as much of the paper as I could in each hand, bent over to put my hands on the inside of my knees, and pulled until I heard my back muscles crack. I let out my breath explosively and looked helplessly at Callahan. He said, Don't feel bad, Carl. Nobody has been able to tear it. You mean it? I asked. I found myself puffing. I had not realized I was straining so hard. Yep, that paper has a tensile of 2,800 pounds per square inch and a tear strength equally unbelievable. I looked at the little sheet and great possibilities began to occur to me. Clothing, I said. Great heavens, think what this will do for the clothing industry. No more weaving. Just run this stuff off on a paper machine at 500 feet per minute. I stopped and looked at Callahan and said, You will be able to make it on a paper-making machine, won't you? As far as I know. Good, I said. When can we try it in the pilot plant? Well, that's where the problem comes in, Carl. I have to leave for the West Coast tomorrow, and I'll be gone for six months. There's nobody else around here to take it through the pilot plant. What's worse, one of my technicians left this morning to take a job with Leif Rood Consultants Incorporated in Boston. The technician is an ethical man and all that, but I'm afraid the word will be out on this paper now. My heart sank. Callahan said, I've already started another of my technicians, John Bostick, on the process to make certain he can repeat my work, but that's all we can do for a few months around here. The laboratories have never been so busy. What do you think we ought to do? The answer was obvious. We've got to file a patent application right away. It isn't ready to file, but we've got to do it anyway. Callahan said, Oh, we're in good shape. We know it works. I nodded and said, What acids other than a dipic will work? Oh, azoleic, 
Sebasic, a few others, I suppose. What else other than amino alcohols? What other catalysts? Do you really need mercury vapor? Will some other metallic vapor do? What about temperature variations in making the polyester? How long a cure time? How much ultraviolet? Will the fibers be better if you draw them more? Can you get those tacky fiber ends in any other way? Can you improve them? What about the sheet making conditions? Does oxygen in the air catalyze? Callahan held up his hands and said, Okay, okay, we don't know anything about it, but we're not going to find out these things until we open a research program, and we can't open a program for at least six months. In the meantime, that technician may... I held up my hands this time, and he fell quiet. We stood silently until I asked, All the information in your notebooks, Henry? He nodded, and I continued. Well, I'll be back tomorrow to talk to you and Bostick. We'll just have to file a patent application on what we have. We chatted a while about his work on the West Coast, and then we shook hands and I left. I had a few moments to think in the cab before I talked with Mr. Spartleton. Here I was in that situation that a patent attorney dreads. I had an incomplete invention, one that required a great deal of work before it could be filed, yet I had to file it now in the incomplete condition. With it all, here was a most significant invention, one that would make the world take notice. This was one of the rare ones. I could feel it in my bones. It was obviously an industry founder, a landmark invention on a par with the greatest, even in its incomplete condition. By golly, I was going to do a job on this one. Mr. Spartleton was in a bad mood when I entered his office. I didn't have a chance to say a thing before he bellowed at me. Mr. Saddle, do you know what a plasticizer is? Why, uh, yes, it is a material generally a solvent that softens and renders another material more flexible. That's right, his fist banged on the desk. Yet here, he waved an office action at me, is an examiner who says that the term plasticizer is indefinite, and I must give a list of suitable plasticizers when he knows that Rule 118 forbids me to put in such a list. Can you imagine? He is saying, in effect, that a chemist who works with synthetic resins does not know what a plasticizer is, and I must take him by the hand and teach him something he learned in freshman chemistry. It has nothing to do with the invention, either. I am claiming a new kind of lens holder, and I point out that the interior of the holder may be coated, if desired, with a plasticized synthetic resin coating. My, I don't know what the office is coming to. The patent office is the only institution in the world that does not know the meaning of the phrase room temperature. Some day. What's the matter, Mr. Saddle? I had pulled up a chair and hunched down in it. Mr. Spartleton recognized the symptoms. He put down the offending office action and settled back and waited for me to tell him my troubles. I said, I've got a hot invention. It is a paper that will replace cloth. Strong, flexible, cheap, too. We've only made one version of it, though, and I have to file an application right away because one of Callahan's technicians left, and we can't risk waiting. He nodded, and I went on, describing to him all the details of the invention and the situation. When I finished, I stared morosely at the floor. Mr. Spartleton said, What's the problem? File a quick application now, and later on, when you have more information, abandon it and file a good full-scale application. I looked at him in surprise and said, But somebody else has just as much information as we have, and he may start to experiment right away. That technician knows as much as we do. In another six months, they could file a complete application and beat us out on dates. They'd be the first with the complete application. Well, what do you propose to do about it? I shrugged. I'll have to make up as good an application as I can right now. We'll make some guesses at how the research would go and put it in. Oh, now look, you don't know, he began ticking off the points on his fingers, if you really need the trialkyl aluminum, or the mercury-treated glass surface, or the heat, or the radiation, or any combination of them. You don't have any idea of the conditions that are necessary to produce this paper. I know. All you've got is a single example that works. If you make your claims broader than that one example, the examiner will reject you for lack of disclosure. This is basic in patent law. Ex parte Cameron, Rule 71 and 35 U.S.C. 112 will do for a starter. 
but I hadn't worked with Mr. Spartleton for nine years for nothing, and he had taught me how to play this game pretty well. I sat up straighter in my chair and said, Yes, but in ex parte Dick and Moncrief, the disclosure of nitric acid as a shrinking agent for yarns was enough to support a claim for shrinking agents broadly. The claim did not have to be limited to nitric acid. Only because nitric acid was already known to be a shrinking agent for yarns. I said, well, a dipic acid is a known polyester ingredient. And all the other ingredients? I did then what he had carefully taught me to do when I was losing an argument. I quickly shifted to another point. In ex parte tab, the applicant merely disclosed raisins and raisin oil, but that was enough to support claims to dried fruit and edible oil. But in that case, the Board of Appeals said they allowed such terminology only because the equivalency of the substances could be foreseen by those skilled in the art, foreseen with certainty, too. Can you say that about your substances? I hesitated before I answered, and that was all he needed to take over. A large number of ingredients was recited in In Re Ellis, and since there was no evidence to show that they all would not work, the applicant was allowed broad claims but you'd have trouble making your guest add ingredients stick. In the case of Corona Cord Tire Company versus Dovin, the court said the patentee was entitled to his broader claims because he proved he had tested a reasonable number of the members of a chemical class. Have you? I started to answer, but Mr. Spartleton was in full swing now, and he said to me, No, sir, you haven't. You are not ready to put in broad claims on a half-baked invention. It was the half-baked that did it. Controlling my temper, I rose to my feet and said in a purposeful and quiet voice, I think I see clearly how this case should be handled in this situation. I shall prepare it in that manner and file it and prosecute it and obtain a strong patent on a Pathfinder invention. I'll keep you posted. I turned and walked out. Just as I passed through the door, I thought I heard him say softly, Attaboy, Carl. But I must have been mistaken. Mr. Spartleton never calls me Carl. I got right at it the very next morning. I opened the office myself and began studying my notes to see how broad a claim I could write for the tear-proof paper case. I listed all the ingredients in one column and then filled up the adjacent columns with all the possible substitutes I could think of. I didn't even know it when Susan arrived at the office, stood in my doorway for a moment, and then tiptoed away. Later on, Mr. Spartleton looked in on me, and I wasn't aware of that either. It was ten o'clock before I finally came up for air, and then I dashed out to the Marshare Laboratory for another talk with Callahan. I explained how I was going to handle the case to make sure we got a good, broad patent application into the patent office. Can you do that? he asked. Oh, yes. We can put in all the things we think will work, but if we are wrong, we are in some degree of trouble. But I feel that with both of us working on this, we ought to be able to turn out a good, sound job. I'll keep sending you drafts out in San Francisco until we finally get one we think good enough to file. But we can't waste time. This is a hot one, and we want to get it in as soon as possible. He shrugged his shoulders, and we sat down to work on my lists. Neither one of us realized it when lunchtime came and went. But that's the way it is with world-beater inventions. They sweep you along. Early that afternoon, I dictated my first draft to Susan. Callahan and I went over the draft, and then he left for San Francisco. The next time around, we had to use air mail. With each new draft, we added more to the basic information we had, rounding out the invention in ever greater detail. I added example after example, being careful to state them in the present tense. I did not want to give the impression that the examples had actually been run. In a month's time, I checked with John Bostick. Bostick had been able to duplicate Callahan's work, and we had three more flimsy, diaphanous sheets that could not be torn by human hands. That was all I needed. Now I knew that anyone could duplicate the tear-proof paper, and I had at least one good, substantial working example for my patent application. The knowledge gave me greater confidence in the alternate materials and procedures that Callahan and I had dreamed up. I prepared a final draft containing 23 pages of detailed specification and 11 examples and topped it all off with 46 claims. It was a magnificent application, considering what I had to start with. I handed it to Mr. Spartleton and sat down to hear what he had to say about it. 
I watched him out of the corner of my eye as he read it, and I had the pleasure of seeing his cigar slowly swing outward until the glowing end was almost beneath one of his ears. This, I knew, was his amazed position, and it was rare indeed that I or anyone else ever saw it. Mr. Spartleton was a man who does not amaze easily. He finished and looked up at me and said, I assume this is the same invention you told me about last month? When I nodded, he continued, And I further assume that you have no experimental data in addition to that you described last month? Again I nodded, and he said, All of this is paperwork with the exception of example one? I nodded again, and he put the draft down in front of him and stared at it. I began to grow uncomfortable in the silence. Then he said, so softly that I could hardly hear him, I remember, many, many years ago, answering the phone, Cliff Norbright, great chemist, telling me he had smelled phenol when he heated ethylene chlorhydrin in the presence of holmium-treated silica gel in a test tube. I wrote the greatest patent application of the age based on that evidence, just like this one. He laid a hand on it and shook his head and smiled. There is no crude guesswork in this product, I said. The work has been duplicated, and I've seen many specimens of this paper. I tell you, sir, there never has been anything like it. Why, even Callahan? Yes? Tell me about Dr. Callahan. He is usually a pretty conservative fellow. How does he feel about this completely untried product? I sat up straighter. This is not an untried product, Mr. Spartleton. It has been made and duplicated. It has all the properties that the application says it has, and Dr. Callahan has just as much faith in it as I have. Mr. Spartleton looked at me and smiled, and slowly handed over the draft. Mr. Saddle, I wish you all the best in your prosecution of this case. Please call on me if there is anything I can do to help. In any way, don't hesitate to call on me. I stood up and took the draft and turned to go, but Mr. Spartleton thrust his hand out. I shook it and said, Is anything wrong with it? Not that I am able to see, Mr. Saddle. It is a most remarkable job, and bespeaks of ingenuity, resourcefulness, and skill. You have come a long way to be able to write such an application. I didn't know what to say, so I smiled and bobbed my head and walked out, still looking at him and smiling which made it necessary for me to walk sideways, and thus made me look, I suppose, somewhat like a crab. Susan put the case in final form. We sent the papers to California for Callahan's signature. Then we filed the case, and things got back to normal with me. It was a great relief not to have the strain on me night and day. That's the trouble with an important case. You live with it too much. It was seven months before I got the first office action in the case. I read the first few paragraphs, and they were quite normal. They rejected the case in the usual manner by citing prior patents that had nothing to do with my application. This kind of thing was just part of the game of prosecution in which the patent examiner makes rejections because that is what he's supposed to do, no matter what the invention. They don't have to make much sense. But then came a paragraph that went way beyond good sense and proper rejection technique. It said, the specification is objected to as containing large portions that are merely laudatory. See Ex parte Grieg 181 OG 266 and Ex parte Wellington 113 OG 2218. These portions are superfluous and should be deleted. Ex parte Ball 1902 CD 1326. The specification is unnecessarily prolix throughout and contains an unduly large number of embodiments. Ex parte Blakeman, 98 OG 791. Shortening is required. I didn't wait. I grabbed the file of the case and almost ran over to the patent office to straighten out the examiner on a few things. As usual, Herbert Crome was the examiner, so I charged up to his desk and immediately began explaining to him the importance of the tearproof paper case. He seemed to pay no attention to me, but I knew him. He was listening. When I finally paused to let him say something, he looked at me quizzically and said, Mr. Saddle, aren't you aware of the notice of October 11, 1955? I looked at him blankly and said, What's that? It says that interviews with examiners are not to be held on Fridays except in exceptional circumstances. I gulped and said, Is today Friday? 
He pushed his desk calendar toward me. It was Friday, all right, and the 13th at that. I was too embarrassed to speak, and I got up and began to walk out. Mr. Crome called after me. This must be an important case, Mr. Saddle. I'll expect to see you the first thing Monday. I nodded and left. By Monday my embarrassment had not diminished. I had really done an unheard-of thing in patent prosecution. In patent prosecution the patent attorney has six months to respond to an office action. Since attorneys carry a docket of cases adapted to fill all their time, an attorney in most instances requires the full six months to respond to an outstanding office action. Industrious attorneys with relatively light dockets might respond in five months' time. This may also happen when the attorney is trying to get a little ahead so he can go on a vacation. There are rare instances of record when an attorney had taken some action in three or four months, but here, in the tear-proof paper case, I had actually gone for an interview on the very first day. I couldn't possibly go back the following Monday. My pride would not allow me. I waited until Tuesday. By that time I had gone over the entire rejection and planned my complete response to the examiner. I sat down with Mr. Crome on Tuesday morning and talked steadily for fifteen minutes before I realized he was watching me instead of paying attention to the case. I said, What's the matter? He said wonderingly, I've never seen you like this before. You're acting almost as unreasonably as an inventor. You don't even want to hear what I have to say about this case. You should relax, Mr. Saddle. You are here as an advocate, not as a midwife. I don't think that's very funny, Mr. Crome. I proceeded to explain the high merit of the case, and he seemed to listen then. Before I left, he promised to give the case careful consideration. This was all he ever promised, so I thanked him and went back to my office. I filed my amendment in the case the next day. It was eight months before I got the next office action. Callahan returned in six months and immediately opened a project on the tear-proof paper. The two of us sat down together to determine the best way to handle the research. I said, Henry, we've already drawn up a complete research program. All we have to do is follow it. We have? Callahan was surprised. Sure. And I laid out in front of him a copy of our patent application and rifled through its pages. All we have to do is go through all the examples here to make certain they all work. If they do, the program will be complete, except for the product itself and commercial production. Our patent application will make the best research guide we could get. Why, certainly, said Callahan, we have already spent a great deal of time working out all kinds of substitute and equivalent reactions. It's all here. Good. I'll set it up. Callahan began distributing the work to various groups, and I went back to my office. Every Friday afternoon thereafter, I went out to the laboratories to see how things were coming along. They came along well. From the beginning, the actual results reached by the research teams matched the predictions we had made in our patent application. At the Friday afternoon meetings, Callahan and I got into the habit of tossing pleased and knowing glances at each other as the streams of data continued to confirm our work. Several months rolled happily by. Then came a letter from the Leif Rood Consultants Incorporated in Boston. The letter said that their people understood that the Marshare Laboratories had under development a remarkably strong paper and they would be very much interested in discussing licensing possibilities with us. I grabbed the letter and stormed into Mr. Spartleton's office. Just read this, I almost yelled as I handed him the letter. This is the outfit that hired Callahan's technician. Now they know all about the tearproof paper. That technician has told them everything. I think we ought to sue them, inducing disclosure of trade secrets or something. I added a great deal more as Mr. Spartleton finished the letter and sat holding it, looking up at me as I paced back and forth in front of his desk. As I walked and talked, I finally became conscious of the fact that Mr. Spartleton was waiting for me to finish. I could tell by the expression on his face. I pulled up in front of him and fell quiet. He said, Don't you feel it is significant that this letter was sent to us, lawyers for Marshare Laboratories, rather than direct to the laboratories? I thought about it, and he continued, Furthermore, as I understand it, the Leif Rude people have a good reputation. That was right, too, and I saw what he was driving at. People of good reputation don't try to pull a fast one by immediately alerting the lawyers for the other side. In fact, when I stopped to think about it, I could see that they were bending over backwards to be careful in this situation. Mr. Spartleton said, as he handed back the letter, 
I suggest you clear with Dr. Marcher and then make arrangements to talk to these people and see if you can negotiate some kind of profitable license. Marcher is pretty fully committed right now, and I don't think he has time to exploit this paper, even if it turns out to amount to something. I looked at him aghast that he should still be doubtful of the paper at this late stage of the game. He saw my look and said, Oops, I mean this milestone in paper technology once it is announced to the world. That seemed better, more to the point. I called Dr. Marcher and found that Mr. Spottleton was right as usual. Dr. Marcher would welcome a beneficial licensing arrangement. I then called the Rude Associates on the phone. It seemed more expeditious than writing. I set up a meeting date as soon as possible, one week away. The day before I left for Boston, I checked in with Callahan to make certain all of our data were correct. We went over every aspect of the tear-proof paper case. I picked out a dozen good samples of the paper of varying composition and thickness and put them in my briefcase along with a copy of the patent application. I had decided that I might even show them a copy of the application if it might help show what a marvelous discovery we had made. Callahan and I shook hands solemnly, and he wished me the best of luck. I went back to my office for a final quick check, got interested in Zabel's book, and went home without my briefcase. There was no harm done. My plane did not leave until ten in the morning, and I had planned to go back to the office anyway. I said good-bye to Susan and Mr. Spartleton, retrieved my briefcase from over by the radiator where Susan had put it the night before, and caught the plane. It was a cold, damp day, and the threat of rain was in the air. In Boston, I caught a cab for the Massachusetts Avenue laboratories of Rood Associates. Dr. Rood himself was at the meeting, along with half a dozen of his associates. Dr. Rood was a small man, dapper, totally unlike a research chemist, and his speech and manner were as impeccable as his dress. Only his hands were a giveaway. They were stained with yellow and black stains that looked completely out of place on the man. Dr. Rood opened the meeting with an explanation concerning the technician he had hired from the Marcher Laboratories two years earlier. Just a week ago, said Dr. Rood, we put him on a problem of paper chemistry. He told us that the properties we sought, and more, had already been found by your laboratory. He said no more, and we would not have allowed him to say any more, except that you were the patent lawyer who was working on the case. That is all we know about it. We hope you have something of mutual interest, but we don't know any more than what I have told you. I said, Thank you, Dr. Rood. I understand how it was. I assure you, it never crossed our minds down in Washington that anything could have been out of line in any matter whatsoever. The assembled group smiled, and I smiled back, and we all felt friendly with one another. Dr. Rood cleared his throat and said, Well, is there anything you can tell us about this tear proof? about a paper having some of these very interesting properties? I said, there is a great deal I can tell you about the paper we have, but suppose I let you see some specimens before I say anything. There's nothing like the actual goods themselves to do most of the talking. We all laughed as I took a half dozen twelve by twelve hand sheets out of my briefcase and passed them around the table. I watched the chemist finger the sheets, savoring their soft coolness, and I heard the whispered comments. Good hand, excellent softness, fine color, and a few others. Dr. Rood said, Are these breaking samples, Mr. Saddle? Do you mind if we tear them? Well, you can see that this was the question I was waiting for. I sat back and allowed a slight smile to play over my face. I said, Oh no, gentlemen, go ahead and tear them. I saw several of the people take the sheets between their thumbs and forefingers and gently pull. I saw the sheets tighten mo momentarily, and then, as if the sheets were no more than ordinary cleansing tissue, I saw the fibers pull apart as each man easily tore the sheet in half. I felt the blood drain from my face, and it seemed to me that my pounding heart must have been visible right through my clothes. I swallowed and tried to say something, although I had no clear idea of what I was going to say. Words would not come. I leaned over and took another sheet from my briefcase and tugged at it. It tore in half with practically no effort. I took another, same results, and still another. I dimly realized that all the people at the meeting were staring at me, but I wasn't concerned. I knew something must be wrong with all the specimens. Possibly I had placed regular cleaning tissues in my briefcase. Or maybe Susan. But even as I thought it, I knew such a mistake was impossible. I reached over and tried tearing one of the sheets I had passed out to the others. It tore into quarters as easily as it had torn into halves. That finished me. 
I leaned back and looked around at the silent group and wondered what Mr. Spottleton would have said at a time like that. I started to smile and discovered that my original smile was still frozen on my face. I stood up and began retrieving the torn papers. They passed them back to me without saying anything. I replaced them in my briefcase, closed it, said, Gentlemen, Christmas falls on Friday this year, and walked out. It was raining outside, but I scarcely noticed. I hailed a cab to the Logan Airport, changed my reservations to an er earlier plane, and returned to Washington. It was a slow trip. The planes were stacked up in the rain at the Washington International Airport, but I did not notice the passage of time. I was too stunned to think clearly, but I kept trying. I got quite wet in Washington, but I was in a hurry to see Mr. Spottleton, and I did not bother to change my clothes. I burst into his office. He looked up and said, well, I didn't expect to see you until tomorrow. How did... He saw my face. I plopped my briefcase on his desk and pulled out all the specimens and dumped them in front of him. I said, Just look at these. This tear-proof paper has deteriorated. These specimens are useless. Right in front of all the rude chemists, they go bad. Most of them are new ones, too. How can this be possible? Just look at them. Mr. Spottleton picked up one of the sheets, rubbed it, and then tugged at it gently to tear it. It did not tear. He pulled harder, and then harder, and it did not tear. I stared at him in disbelief and said, Oh, Mr. Spartleton, this is no time to play games with me. I took one of the sheets and yanked it, and almost cut my fingers. I bent over and put my hands on my knees to get better leverage just as I had the very first time, but the sheet would not tear. I threw it on the desk and tried another with the same results. One after another I ran through them all while Mr. Spartleton sat back and watched me. I was wild-eyed when I finished. Mr. Spartleton said, Mr. Saddle, would you mind telling me what has happened? I pulled up a chair and groped for my voice and finally got the story out. He looked at me strangely, tried to tear another of those miserable little sheets and said, Mr. Saddle, do you feel all right? In Boston I had been completely deflated and bewildered, but now I was mad. I grabbed up the phone and called Callahan. I had barely started to pour out the story when he said, I'm glad you called, Carl. We seem to have run into something on this paper thing. Looks bad. Can you come out? Be right there. I hung up. Mr. Spartleton went out with me. He didn't want me to go anywhere alone. Callahan was holding two sheets up to the light when we went into his lab. He said, Two identical sheets, except for the moisture content. Moisture is the devil. One of these is dry. The other contains 3% moisture. Here's the dry one. He tore it in half effortlessly. Here's the moist one, and he strained at it, but it would not tear. We just ran across this effect last night and finished checking it out an hour ago. Have you been to Root Associates yet? I nodded. Too bad. We'll have to show them what can happen. Mr. Spartleton said, They already know. Callahan said, This kicks the whole thing in the head. The paper can never be more than a laboratory curiosity as far as we can see. The sun, a dry climate, heat, any of these things will drive off the moisture, and the paper will lose its strength. There's no way we can market a product like that when it might lose its strength at any time. I'm afraid the tear-proof paper must join the huge list of fine products that can't be sold because of one small flaw. It was Mr. Spartleton who steered me out of the labs. He slipped an arm through mine and said, You can refile the patent application and add this information about the moisture content. You ought to get the patent without too much trouble, even if the product is of no commercial value. I nodded as we stood in the rain waiting for a cab. He said, I never told you what happened in that phenol case of mine many years ago. It turned out that the man at the next bench had spilled a little phenol on the bench top. That's what my inventor smelled. There never was any phenol in the test tube. We all fall over the facts of a case now and then. He squeezed my arm and the rain did not seem to fall quite as hard. End of the Professional Approach by Charles Leonard Harness and Theodore Lockhart Thomas Recording by Joelle Peebles Test Rocket This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark Test Rocket by Jack Douglas 
It's amazing how much you can learn about absolute strangers if you just stop to think about the kind of an animal they'll put in a test rocket. Captain Baird stood at the window of the laboratory where the thousand parts of the strange rocket lay strewn in careful order. Small groups worked slowly over the dismantled parts. The captain wanted to ask, but something stopped him. Behind him, Dr. Johansson sat at his desk, his gnarled old hand tight about a whiskey bottle, the bottle the doctor always had in his desk, but never brought out except when he was alone, and waited for Captain Baird to ask his question. Captain Baird turned at last. "'They are our markings?' Captain Baird asked. It was not the question. Captain Baird knew the markings of the rocket testing station as well as the doctor did. "'Yes,' the doctor said. "'They are our markings. Identical. But not our paint.' Captain Baird turned back to the window. Ten minutes after launching, the giant test rocket had been only a speck on the observation screen. Captain Baird had turned away in disgust. A mouse, the captain had said. Unfortunate a mouse can't observe, build, report. My men are getting restless, Johansson. When we are ready, Captain, the doctor had said. It was twelve hours before the urgent call from Central Control brought the captain running back to the laboratory. The doctor was there before him. Professor Schultz wasted no time. He pointed to the instrument panel. A sudden shift. See for yourself. We'll miss Mars by a million and a quarter at least. Two hours later, the shift in course of the test rocket was apparent to all of them, and so was their disappointment. According to the instruments, the steering shifted a quarter of an inch. No reason shows up, Professor Schultz said. Fly in the metal, Dr. Johansson said. How far can it go? Captain Baird asked. Professor Schultz shrugged. Until the fuel runs out, which is probably as good as never. Or until the landing mechanism is activated by a planet-sized body. Course? Did you plot it? The doctor asked. Of course I did, Professor Schultz said. As close as I can calculate, it is headed for Alpha Centauri. Captain Baird turned away. The doctor watched him. Perhaps you will not be quite so hasty with your men's lives in the future, Captain, the doctor said. Professor Schultz was spinning dials. No contact, the professor said. No contact at all. That had been six months ago. Three more test rockets had been fired successfully before the urgent report came through from Alaskan Observation Post Number 4. A rocket was coming across the pole. The strange rocket was tracked and escorted by atomic armed fighters all the way to the rocket testing station, where it cut its own motors and gently landed. In the center of a division of atomic armed infantry, the captain, the doctor, and everyone else waited impatiently. There was an air of uneasiness. You're sure it's not ours? Captain Baird asked. The doctor laughed. Identical, yes three times the size of ours. Perhaps one of the Asian ones? No, it's our design, but too large. Much too large. Professor Schultz put their thoughts into words. Looks like someone copied ours. Someone, somewhere. It's hard to imagine, but true, nevertheless. They waited two weeks. Nothing happened. Then a radiation-shielded team went in to examine the rocket. Two more weeks, and the strange rocket was dismantled and spread over the field of the testing station. The rocket was dismantled, and the station had begun to talk to itself in whispers and look at the sky. Captain Baird stood now at the window and looked out at the dismantled rocket. He looked, but his mind was not on the parts of the rocket he could see from the window. The materials. They're not ours? the captain asked. Unknown here, the doctor said. The captain nodded. Those were our instruments? Yes, the doctor still held the whiskey bottle in a tight grip. They sent them back, the captain said. The doctor crashed the bottle hard against the desktop. Ask it, captain, for God's sake! The captain turned to face the doctor directly. 
It was a man. A full-grown man. The doctor sighed as if letting the pent-up steam of his heart escape. Yes, it is a man. It breathes. It eats. It has all the attributes of a man. But it is not of our planet. It's speech, the captain began. That isn't speech, Captain, the doctor broke in, breaking in sharply. It's only sound. The doctor stopped. He examined the label of his bottle of whiskey very carefully. Good brand of whiskey. He seems quite happy in the storeroom. You know, Captain, what puzzled me at first? He can't read. He can't read anything, not even the instruments in that ship. In fact, he shows no interest in his rocket at all. The captain sat down now. He sat at the desk and faced the doctor. At least they had the courage to send a man, not a mouse, doctor. A man. The doctor stared at the captain, his hands squeezing and unsqueezing on the whiskey bottle. A man who can't read his own instruments? The doctor laughed. Perhaps you too have failed to see the point. Like that stupid general who sits out there waiting for the men from somewhere to invade. Don't you think it's a possibility? The doctor nodded. A very good possibility, Captain. But they will not be men. The doctor seemed to pause and lean forward. That rocket, Captain, is a test rocket. A test rocket just like ours. Then the doctor picked up his whiskey bottle at last and poured two glasses. Perhaps a drink, Captain? The captain was watching the sky outside the window. The end. Vanishing Point by C. C. Beck This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski Vanishing Point by C. C. Beck In perspective, theoretically the vanishing point is at infinity, and therefore unattainable. But reality is different. Vanishment occurs a lot sooner than theory suggests. That? Oh, that's a perspective machine. Well, not exactly, but that's what I call it. No, I don't know how it works. Too complicated for me. Carter could make it go, but after he made it, he never used it. Too bad. He thought he'd make a lot of money with it there for a while, while he was working it out. Almost had me convinced, but I told him, Get it to working first, Carter, and then show me what you can do with it, better than I can do without it. I'm pretty well as is. Pictures selling good even if I do make them all by guesswork, as you call it. That's what I told him. You see, Carter was one of them artists that think they can work everything out by formulas and stuff. Me? I just paint things as I see them. Never worry about perspective and all that kind of mechanical aids. Never even went to art school. But I do all right. Carter, now, was a different sort of artist. Well, he wasn't really an artist. More of a draftsman. I first got him in to help me with a series of real estate paintings I'd got an order for. Big aerial views of land developments and drawings of buildings, roads and causeways, that kind of stuff. It was a little too much for me to handle alone, because I never studied that kind of things, you know. I thought he'd do the mechanical drawings, which should have been simple for anybody trained that way, and I'd throw in the colors, figures and trees and so on. He did fine. Job came out good, client was real happy. We made a pretty good amount on the job. Enough to keep us for a couple of months without working afterwards. I took it easy, fishing and so on. But Carter stayed here in the studio, working on his own stuff. I let him keep an eye on things for me around the place and just dropped in now and then to check up. The guy was nuts on the subject of perspective. I thought he knew all there was to know about it already. But he claimed nobody knew anything about it, really said he'd been studying it for years, and the more he learned about it, 
the more there was to learn. He used to cover big sheets of paper with complicated diagrams trying to prove something or other to himself. I'd come into the studio and find him with thumbtacks and strings and stuff all over the place. He'd get big long rulers and draw lines to various points all over the room and end up with a little drawing of a cube about an inch square that anybody could have made in half a minute without all the apparatus. Seemed pretty silly to me. Then he brought in some books on mathematics and physics and other things, and a bunch of slide rules, calculators, and junk. He must have been a pretty smart guy to know how to handle all of those things, even if he was kind of dopey about other things. You know, women and fishing and sports and drinking. He was lousy at everything, except working those perspective problems. Personally, I couldn't see much sense to what he was doing. The guy could draw all right already. So I asked him what more did he want. Let me see if I can remember what he said. I'm trying to get at things as they really are, not as they appear, he said. I think those were his words. Art is an illusion, a bag of tricks. Reality is something else, not what we think it is. Drawings are two-dimensional projections of a world that is not merely three, but four-dimensional if not more, he said. Yeah, kind of a crackpot, Carter was. Just on that one subject, though, nice enough guy otherwise. Here, look at some of the drawings he made, working out his formulas. Nice designs, huh? Might make good wallpaper or fabric plans. Real abstract. That's what people seem to like. See all those little letters scattered around among the lines? Different kinds of vanishing points they are. Carter claimed the whole world was full of vanishing points. You don't know what a vanishing point is? Let me see if I can explain. Come over to the window here. You see how that road out there gets smaller and smaller in the distance? Of course, the road doesn't really get smaller. It just looks that way. That's what we call a vanishing point in drawing. Simple, isn't it? Never could understand why Carter went to so much trouble working out all those ways to locate vanishing points. Me? I just throw them in wherever I need them. But Carter claimed that was wrong. Said they were all connected together some way. And he was going to work out a method to prove it. Here, here's a little gadget he made to help his calculations. Bunch of disks all pivoted together at the center. You're supposed to turn them around so the arrows point to the different figures and things. Here's the square root sign. I remember Carter telling me that. This one is the tangent function, whatever that means. Log, there is short for logarithm. Oh, he had a bunch of that scientific stuff in his head at, all the time. Don't know whether he understood it all himself. He built this thing just before he put together the perspective machine there. Silly looking gadget, huh? All them pipes and wires and that little cube in the center? Don't try to touch it. It ain't really there. You just think it is. It's what Carter called a tet tetaract or cataract. No, that ain't the right word. Something like that. Tesser something or other. There's a picture like it in one of Carter's books. Hurt your eyes to look at it, don't it? That's what Carter thought was going to make him a lot of fame and money. That perspective machine. I told him nobody had ever made a drawing machine yet that worked, but he said it wasn't supposed to make drawings. It was just supposed to give people a view of what reality really is, instead of what they think it is. I don't know whether he expected to charge money to look through it, or whether he was going to look through it himself and make some new kind of drawings and sell them. No, I can't tell you how it works. I said before, I don't know. Carter only used it once himself. I came in here the day he finished it, just as he was ready to turn it on. He was just putting the finishing touches on it. In a few minutes, he told me, I'll have the answer to a question that may never have been answered before. What is reality? Is the world a thing by itself and all we know illusion? Why do things grow smaller the farther away from us they appear? Why can't we see more than one side of anything at a time? What happens to the far side of an object? Does it cease to exist just because we can't see it? Are objects not present, non-existent? Because artists draw things vanishing to points, 
Does that mean that they really vanish? A whack. That's what he was. Nice guy, but sort of screwy. He kept saying more goofy things while he was finishing up the machine. About how he'd figured out that all we knew about vision and drawing and so on must be wrong. And that once he got a look at the real world, he'd prove it. How about cameras, I asked him. Take a picture with a camera and it looks just about the same as a drawing, don't it? That's because cameras are built to take pictures like we're used to seeing them, he said. Flat, two-dimensional slices of reality, without depth or motion. Even 3D moving pictures, I asked. They're closer to reality, he admitted, but they are still only cross-sections of it. The shutter of a movie camera is closed as much of the time as it is open. What happens in between the times it's open? You know, he went on, people used to think matter and motion were continuous. But scientists have proved that they are discontinuous. Now some of them think time may be, too. Maybe everything is just imaginary and appears to our senses in whatever way we want it to appear. We are so well trained that we see everything just as we are taught to see it by generations of artists, writers, and other symbol makers. If we could see things as they really are, what might happen? We'd probably all go nuts, I told him. He just smiled. Well, here goes, he said. It's finished. Now to find out who was right. The scientists and philosophers who say reality is forever unreachable? Or the artists who say there isn't any reality? that we make the whole thing up to suit ourselves. He moved one of those pointers you see there and squinted around at different scales and dials and then stepped back. That little Tessie thing appeared, real small at first, just a point. You could hardly see it. I couldn't see anything else happening and thought he was going something else to the machine. I turned to look at Carter and saw his face was white as a sheet. Good God, he says, just like that. Good God! That's all. Well, I says to him, who was right? The scientists or the artists? The artists, he sort of screeches. The artists were right all the time. There is no reality. It's all a fabric of illusion we've created ourselves. And now I've ripped a hole in that. He gives a strangled hoot and goes hightailing out of here like something was after him. Jumps in his car and roars off down the road and disappears. No, nah, I don't mean he really disappeared. Are you nuts? Just roared on down the road till he got so small I couldn't see him no more. You know, the way things do when they go farther and farther away? Happens every day. That's what us artists mean by perspective. The machine? Well, I don't know what to do with it. If Carter ever comes back, he might not like my getting rid of it. I was thinking maybe I'd put it in the hobby show at the county fair next week, though. You notice how that funny-looking cube inside there gets bigger every time you look at it? There, it's just doubled its size again, see? People at the fair ought to get a big kick out of that. No telling how big it'll get with all those people looking at it. Come on, let's go fishing. We'd better hurry or it'll be too late. End of Vanishing Point by C.C. C. Beck Recording by Dan Grzynski, Buffalo, New York. The Worshippers by Damon Knight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite The Worshippers by Damon Knight Section 1 Destiny reached out a hand to Algernon Weaver, but he was a timid man at first. But on the strange world of Terra Nova there was much to be learned of destiny and other things. It was a very different thing, Algernon Weaver decided, actually to travel in space. When you read about it or thought about it in terms of what you read, it was more a business of going from one name to another. Algol to Sirius, Aldebaran to Epsilon Seti. You read the names and the descriptions that went with them, and the whole thing 
although breathtaking in concept, of course, when you really stop to meditate on it, became rather ordinary and prosaic and somehow more understandable. Not that he had ever approved. No. He had that, at least, to look back upon. He had seen the whole enterprise as pure presumption and had said so often. The heavens were the heavens and the earth was the earth. It would have been better, much better, for all concerned if it had been left that way. He had held that opinion, he reminded himself gratefully, from the very beginning, when it was easy to think otherwise. Afterward, of course, when the first starships came back with the news that space was a swarm with creatures who did not even resemble man and had never heard of him and did not think much of him when they saw him, well, who but an idiot could hold any other opinion? If only the Creator had not seen fit to make so many human beings in his image, but without his common sense. Well. If he hadn't, then, for one thing, Weaver would not have been where he was now, staring out an octagonal porthole at an endless sea of diamond-pierced blackness, with the empty ship humming to itself all around him. It was an entirely different thing, he told himself. There were no names and no descriptions and no feeling of going from one known place to another known place. It was more like... It was like standing outdoors on a still summer night and looking up at the dizzying depths of the stars and then looking down to discover that there was no planet under your feet and that you were all alone in that alien gulf. It was enough to make a grown man cry, and Weaver had cried, often in the empty red twilight of the ship, feeling himself hopelessly and forever cut off, cast out and forgotten. But as the weeks passed a kind of numbness had overtaken him, till now. When he looked out the porthole at the incredible depth of sky, he felt no emotion but a thin, disapproving regret. Sometimes he would describe himself to himself, just to refute the feeling that he was not really here, not really alive, but his mind was too orderly and the description would come out so cold and terse. Algernon James Weaver, born 1942, historian, civic leader, poet, teacher, philosopher, author of Development of the School System in Schenectady and Schoharie Counties, New York, Pamphlet, 1975, An Address to the Women's Clubs of Schenectady, New York, Pamphlet, 1979, Rhymes of a Philosopher, 1981, Parables of a Philosopher, 1983, Reflections of a Philosopher, 1986, Born in Detroit, Michigan, son of a Methodist minister, educated in Michigan and New York public schools. B.A., New York State University, 1959, M.A., N.Y.S.U. Extension, 1964, Unmarried, Surviving Relatives. That was the trouble. It began to sound like an obituary, and then the great humming metal shell would begin to feel like a coffin. Presumption. Pure presumption. None of these creatures should have been allowed to get loose among the stars, man least of all. It cluttered up the universe. It undermined faith and it had got Algernon Weaver into a devil of a fix. It was his sister's fault, actually. She would go, in spite of his advice, up to the moon to the UN sanitarium in Aristarchus. Weaver's sister, a big-framed definite woman, had a weak heart and seventy-five superfluous pounds of fat. Doctors had told her that she would live twenty years longer on the moon. Therefore, she went, and survived the trip, and thrived in the germ-free atmosphere weighing just one-sixth of her former two hundred and ten pounds. Once she was there, Weaver could hardly escape visiting her. Harriet was a widow with large resources, and Weaver was her only near relative. It was necessary, it was prudent for him to keep on her good side. Moreover, he had his family feeling. He did not like it, not a minute of it not the incredible trip, rising till the earth lay below like a botched model of itself, not the silent mausoleum of the moon. But he dully admired Harriet's spacious room in the sanitarium, the recreation rooms, the auditorium. Space-suited, he walked with her in the cold earthlight. He attended her on the excursion trip to Ley Field, the interstellar rocket base on the far side of the moon. The alien ship was there, all angles and planes. It came from Zeta Auriga. They told him it was the second foreign ship to visit Sol. Most of the crew had been ferried down to Earth, where they were inspecting the people. Without approval, Weaver was sure. Meanwhile, the remaining crewman would be pleased to have the sanatorium party inspect him. They went aboard. Harriet and two other women and six men, counting the guide and Weaver. The ship was a red-lit cavern, 
the crewman turned out to be a hairy horror, a three-foot headless lump shaped like an eggplant, supported by four splayed legs and with an indefinite number of tentacles wriggling below the stalked eyes. They're more like us than you think, said the guide. They're mammals. They have a nervous organization very like ours. They're susceptible to some of our diseases, which is very rare, and they even share some of our minor vices. He opened his kit and offered the thing a plug of chewing tobacco, which was refused with much tentacle waving, and a cigar, which was accepted. The creature stuck the cigar into the pointed tip of its body just above the six beady black eyes, lit it with some sort of flameless lighter, and puffed clouds of smoke like a volcano. And of course, as you see, they're oxygen breathers, the guide finished. The atmosphere in the ship here is almost identical to our own. We could breathe it without any discomfort, whatever. Then why don't we, Weaver thought irritably. He had been forced to wear either a breathing mask or a pressure suit all the time he had been on the moon, except when he had been in his own sealed room at the sanatorium, and his post-nasal drip was unmistakably maturing into a cold. He had been stifling sneezes for the last half hour. He was roused by a commotion up ahead. Someone was on the floor, and the others were crowding around. Help me carry her, said the guide's voice sharply in his earphones. We can't treat her here. What is she, a heart case? Good Lord, clear the way there, will you? Weaver hurried up, struck by a sharp suspicion. Indeed, it was Harriet who was being carried out, and a good thing, he thought, that they didn't have to support her full weight. He wondered vaguely if she would die before they got her to a doctor. He could not give this thought his full attention, or feel as much fraternal anxiety as he ought, because he had, he, he had to sneeze. The others had crowded out into the red-lit space of the control room where the airlock was. Weaver stopped and frantically tugged his arm free of the rubberoid sleeve. The repressed spasm was an acute agony in his nose and throat. He fumbled the handkerchief out of his pocket, thrust his hand up under the helmet, and blissfully let go. His eyes were watering. He wiped them hurriedly, put the handkerchief away, worked his arm back into the sleeve, and looked around to see what had become of the others. The airlock door was closed, and there was no one in the room but the hairy eggplant shape of the Aurigan still puffing its cigar. Hey, said Weaver, forgetting his manners. The Aurigan did not turn, but then which was its front or back? The beady black eyes regarded him without expression. Weaver started forward. He got nearly to the airlock before a cluster of hairy tentacles barred his way. He said indignantly, Let me out, you monster! Let me out, do you hear? The creature stood stock still in an infuriating attitude until a little light on the wall changed from orange to red-violet. Then it crossed to the control board, did something there, and the inner door of the lock swung open. Well, I should think so, said Weaver. He stepped forward again, but his eyes were beginning to water. There was an intolerable tickling far back in his nostrils. He was going to... He was... Eyes squeezed shut, his whole body contorted with effort. He raised his arm to begin the desperate race once more. His hand brushed against something, his kit, slung just above his waist. There were handkerchiefs in the kit, he recalled suddenly, and he remembered what the guide had said about Oregon air. He tugged the kit open, fumbled and found a handkerchief. He zipped open the closure of his helmet and tilted the helmet back. He brought up the handkerchief and gave himself over to spasm. He was startled by a hoarse boom, as if someone had scraped the strings of an amplified bull fiddle. He looked around, blinking, and discovered that the sound was coming from the Oregon. The monster, with its tentacles tightly curled around the tip of its body, was scuttling into the corridor. As Weaver watched in confusion, it vanished, and a sheet of metal slid across the doorway. More boomings came shortly from a source Weaver finally identified as a grill over the control panels. He took a step that way, then changed his mind and turned back towards the airlock. Just as he reached the nearer airlock door, the farther one swung open, and an instant torrent of wind thrust him outward. Strangling, Weaver grabbed desperately at the doorframe as it went by. He swung with a sickening thud into the inner wall, but he hung on and pulled himself back inside. The force of the wind was dropping rapidly. So was the air pressure. Ragged black blotches swam before Weaver's eyes. He fumbled with his helmet, trying to swing it back over his head, but it stubbornly remained where it was. The blow when he struck the airlock wall, he thought dimly, it must have bent the helmet so that it would not fit into its grooves. He forced himself across the room toward the faint gleam of the Oregon control board, shaped like a double horseshoe it was, around the two lattice-topped stools and bristling with levers, knobs, and sliding panels. One of these, he knew, controlled the airlock. 
He slapped blindly at them, pulling, pushing, turning as many as he could reach. Then the floor reeled under him, and as he fell toward it changed into a soft, gray, endless mist. When he awoke the airlock door was closed. His lungs were gratefully full of air. The Aragon was nowhere to be seen. The door behind which he had disappeared was still closed. Weaver got up, stripped off his spacesuit, and by hammering with the sole of one of his boots managed to straighten out the dent in the back of the helmet. He put the suit back on, then looked doubtfully at the control board. It wouldn't do to go on pulling things at random. He might cause some damage. Tentatively he pushed a slide he remembered touching before. When nothing happened he pushed it back. He tried a knob, then a lever. The inner door of the airlock swung open. Weaver marched into it, took one look through the viewport set in the outer door, and scrambled back out. He closed the airlock again and thought a minute. In the center of each horseshoe curve of the control board was a gray translucent disk with six buttons under it. They might, Weaver thought, be television screens. He pressed the first button under one of them and the screen lighted up. He pressed the second button, then all the others in turn. They all showed him the same thing, the view he had seen from the viewport in the airlock. Stars, and nothing but stars. The moon, incredibly, had disappeared. He was in space. His first thought, when he was able to think correctly again, was to find the Oregon and make him put things right. He tried all the remaining knobs and levers and buttons on the control board, reckless of consequences, until the door slid open again. Then he went down the corridor and found the Oregon. The creature was lying on the floor with a turnip-shaped thing over its head, tubes trailing from it to an opened cabinet in the wall. It was dead, dead and decaying. He searched the ship. He found storerooms, with cylinders and bales of stuff that looked as if it might possibly be food. He found the engine room with great piles of outlandishly sculptured metal and winking lights and swinging meter needles. But he was the only living thing on board. The view from all six directions in the control room telescreens and in the ship's direct viewports alike was exactly the same. The stars, like dandruff on Weaver's blue serge suit. No one of them apparently any nearer than the others. No way to tell which, if any of them, was his own. The smell of the dead creature was all through the ship. Weaver closed his helmet against it, then remembered that the air in his suit tank would not last forever. He lugged the corpse out to the airlock, closed the inner door on it, and opened the outer one. It was hard for him to accept the obvious explanation of the Oregon's death, but he finally came to it. He recalled something the guide had said about the Oregon's susceptibility to earthly infections. That must have been it. That had been why the creature had bellowed and run to seal itself off from him. It was all his fault. If he had not sneezed with his helmet open, the Oregon would not be dead, he would not be marooned in space, and the other Oregans down on Earth would not be marooned there. Though they, he decided wistfully, would probably get home sooner or later. They knew where home was. As far as he could, he made himself master of the ship and its contents. He discovered, by arduous trial and error, which of the supposed foods in the storeroom he could eat safely, which would make him sick, and which were not foods at all. He found out which of the control board's knobs and levers controlled the engines, and he shut them off. He studied the universe around him, hoping to see some change. After nearly a month it happened. One star grew from a brilliant pinpoint to a tiny disk, and each time he awoke it was larger. Weaver took counsel with himself and pasted a small piece of transparent red tape over the place on the telescreen where the star appeared. He scratched a mark to show where the star was on each of three succeeding days. The trail crawled diagonally down toward the bottom of the screen. He knew nothing about astrogation, but he knew that if he were heading toward a star it ought to stay in the same place on his screen. He turned on the engines and swung the steering arm downward. The star crawled back toward the center of the screen, then went past. Weaver painstakingly brought it back, and so in parsec-long zigzags he held his course. The star was now increasing alarmingly in brightness. It occurred to Weaver that he must be traveling with some enormous speed, although he had no sensation of movement at all. There was a position on the scale around the steering arm that he thought would put the engines into reverse. He tried it, and now he scratched the apparent size of the star into the red tape. First it grew by leaps and bounds, then more slowly, then hardly at all. Weaver shut off the engines again and waited. 
The star had planets. He noted their passage in the telescreen, marked their apparent courses, and blithely set himself to land on the one that seemed to be nearest. He was totally ignorant of orbits. He simply centered his planet on the screen as he had done with the star, found that it was receding from him, and began to run it down. He came in too fast the first time, tore through the atmosphere like a lost soul and frantically out again, sweating in the control room's sudden heat. He turned out in space and carefully adjusted his speed so that ship and planet drifted softly together. Gently, as if he had been doing this all his life, Weaver took the ship down upon a continent of rolling greens and browns, landed it without a jar, saw the landscape begin to tilt as he stepped into the airlock and barely got outside before the ship rolled ten thousand feet down a gorge he had not noticed and smashed itself into a powdering of fragments. Two days later, he began turning into a god. Section 2 They had put him into a kind of enclosed seat at the end of a long rotating arm, counterweighted at the opposite side of the aircar proper, and the whole affair swung gently in an eccentric path around and around and up and down as the aircar moved very slowly forward through the village. All the houses were faced with broad wooden balconies, stained blood-red and turquoise, umber and yellow, gold and pale green and all of these were crowded to bursting with the blue and white horny chests and the big-eyed faces of the bug things. Weaver swung in his revolving seat past first one level and another, and the twittering voices burst around him like the stars of a Fourth of July rocket. This was the fifth village they had visited since the bug things had found him wandering in the mountains. At the first one he had been probed, examined, and twittered over interminably. Then the air car had arrived. They had strapped him into this ridiculous seat and begun what looked very much like a triumphal tour. Other air cars without the revolving arm preceded and followed him. The slowly following cars and their riders were gay with vari-colored streamers. Every now and then one of the bug things in the cars would raise a pistol-like object to fire a pinkish streak that spread out high in the air and became a gently descending, diffusing cloud of rosy dust and always the twittering rose and fell, rose and fell, as Weaver revolved at the end of the swinging arm. One had to remember, he reminded himself, that earthly parallels did not necessarily apply. It was undignified, certainly, to be revolving like a child on a merry-go-round while these crowds glared with bright alien eyes. But the important thing was that they had not once offered him any violence. They had not even put him into the absurd revolving seat by force. They had led him to it gently, with a great deal of gesturing and twittering explanation, and if their faces were almost nauseatingly unpleasant with the constantly moving complexity of parts that he had seen in live lobsters, well, that proved nothing except that they were not human. Later, perhaps, he could persuade them to wear masks. It was a holiday, a great occasion. Everything testified to that. The colored streamers, the clouds of rosy dust-like sky rockets, the crowds of people lined up to await him. And why not? Clearly they had never before seen a man. He was unique, a personage to be honored, a visitor descended from the heavens, clothed in fire and glory like the Spaniards among the Aztecs, he thought. Weaver began to feel gratified, his ego expanding. Experimentally he waved to the massed ranks of bug things as he passed them. A new explosion of twittering broke out, and a forest of twig-like arms waved back at him. They seemed to regard him with happy awe. "'Thank you,' said Weaver graciously. "'Thank you.' In the morning there were crowds massed outside the building where he had slept, but they did not put him into the air car with the revolving arm again. Instead, four new ones came into his room after he had eaten the strange red and orange fruits that were all of the bug diet he could stomach and began to twitter very seriously at him, while pointing to various objects, parts of their bodies, the walls around them, and Weaver himself. After a while Weaver grasped the idea that he was being instructed. He was willing to cooperate, but he did not suppose for a moment that he could master the bird-like sounds they made. Instead he took an old envelope and a stub of pencil from his pocket and wrote the English word for each thing they pointed out. Orange, he wrote. It was not an orange, but the color was the same at any rate. Thorax, wall, man, mandibles. In the afternoon they brought a machine with staring lenses and bright lights. Weaver guessed that he was being televised. He put a hand on the nearest bug thing's shoulder and smiled for his audience. 
Later, after he had eaten again, they went on with the language lesson. Now it was Weaver who taught, and they who learned. This, Weaver felt, was as it should be. These creatures were not men, he told himself. He would give himself no illusions on that score, but they might still be capable of learning many things that he had to teach. He could do a great deal of good, even if it turned out that he could never return to Earth. He rather suspected they had no spaceships. There was something about their life, the small villages, the slowly drifting air cars, the absence of noise and smell and dirt, that somehow it did not fit with the idea of space travel. As soon as he was able, he asked them about it. No, they had never traveled beyond their own planet. It was a great marvel. Perhaps he could teach them how sometime. As their command of written English improved, he catechized them about themselves and their planet. The world, as he knew already, was much like Earth as to atmosphere, gravity, and mean temperature. It occurred to him briefly that he had been lucky to hit upon such a world, but the thought did not stick. He had no way of knowing just how improbable his luck had been. They themselves were, as he had thought, simple beings. They had a written history of some twelve thousand of their years, which he estimated to be about nine thousand of his. Their technical accomplishments, he had to grant, equaled Earth's and in some cases surpassed them. Their social organization was either so complex that it escaped him altogether, or unbelievably simple. They did not, so far as he could discover, have any political divisions. They did not make war. They were egg-layers, and they controlled their population simply by means of hatching only as many eggs as were needed to replace their natural losses. Just when it first struck Weaver that he was their appointed ruler, it would be hard to say. It began, perhaps, that afternoon in the aircar, or a few days later, when he made his first timid request for a house of his own. The request was eagerly granted, and he was asked how he would like the house constructed. Half timidly he drew sketches of his own suburban home in Schenectady, and they built it, swarms of them working together, down to the hardwood floors and the pneumatic furniture and the picture moldings and the lampshades. Or, Perhaps the idea crystallized when he asked to see some of their native dances, and within an hour the dancers assembled on his lawn, five hundred of them, and performed until sundown. At any rate, nothing could have been more clearly correct once he had grasped the idea. He was a man, alone in a world of outlandish creatures. It was natural that he should lead. Indeed, it was his duty. They were poor things, but they were malleable in his hands. It was a great adventure. Who knew how far he might not bring them? Weaver embarked on a tour of the planet, taking with him two of the bug things as guides and a third as pilot and personal servant. Their names in their own tongue he had not bothered to ask. He had christened them Mark, Luke, and John. All three now wrote and read English with fair proficiency, thus Weaver was well served. The trip was entirely enjoyable. He was met everywhere by the same throngs, the same delight and enthusiasm as before, and between villages there seemed to be nothing on the planet that could be called a city, the rolling green countryside dotted with bouquets of yellow and orange-flowered trees was most soothing to the eye. Weaver noted the varieties of strangely shaped and colored plants and the swarms of bright flying things and began an abortive collection. He had to give it up for the present, there were too many things to study. He looked forward to a few books to be compiled later when he had time for the guidance of Earthmen at some future date. The flora of Terra Nova, the fauna of Terra Nova. All that was in the distant future. Now he was chiefly concerned with the Terra Novans themselves, how they lived, what they thought, what sort of primitive religion they had, and so on. He asked endless questions of his guides and through them of the villagers they met. And the more he learned, the more agitated he became. But this is monstrous, he wrote indignantly to Mark and Luke. They had just visited a house inhabited by seventeen males and twelve females. Weaver was now beginning to be able to distinguish the sexes, and he had inquired what their relations were. Mark had informed him calmly that they were husbands and wives, and when Weaver pointed out that the balance was uneven, had written, No, not one to one, all to all, all husband and wife of each other. Mark held Weaver's indignant message up to his eyes with one many-jointed claw, while his other three forelimbs gestured uncertainly. Finally he seized the notepad and wrote, Do not understand monstrous. Please forgive. They do for more change, so not to make each other have tiredness. Weaver frowned and wrote, Does not your religion forbid this? 
Mark consulted in his own piping tongue with the other two. Finally he surrendered the notepad to Luke, who wrote, Do not understand religion to forbid. Please excuse. With us, many religion. Some say spirits in flower, some say in wind and sun, some say in ground. Not say to do this, not to do that. With us, all people the same. No one tell other what to do. Weaver added another mental note to his already lengthy list. Build churches. He wrote, Tell them this must stop. Mark turned without hesitation to the silently attentive group and translated. He turned back to Weaver and wrote, They ask please what to do now instead of the way they do. Weaver told him they must mate only one to one and for life. To his surprise, the translation of this was greeted by unmistakable twitterings of gladness. The members of the adulterous group turned to each other with excited gestures, and Weaver saw a pairing-off process begin with much discussion. He asked Mark about it later as they were leaving the village. How is it that they did this thing before, for more variety, as you say, and yet seem so glad to stop? Mark's answer was, They very glad to do whatever thing you say. You bring them new thing. They are very happy. Weaver mused on this contentedly on the whole, but with a small undigested kernel of uneasiness, until they reached the next village. Here he found a crowd of Terranovans of both sexes and all ages at a feast of something with a fearful stench. He asked what it was. Mark's answer had better not be revealed. Feeling genuinely sick with revulsion, Weaver demanded, Why do they do such an awful thing? This is ten times worse than the other. This time Mark answered without hesitation. They do this like the other, for more change. It is not easy to learn to like, but they do, so not to make themselves have tiredness. There were three more such incidents before they reached the village where they were to sleep that night, and Weaver lay awake in his downy bed, staring at the faint shimmer of reflected starlight on the carved roof beams, and meditating soberly on the unexpected, the appalling magnitude of the task he had set for himself. From this he came to consider that small, dark kernel of doubt. It was, of course, dreadful to find that his people were so wholly corrupt, but that at least was understandable. What he did not understand was the reason they could be so easily weaned from their wickedness. It left him feeling a little off balance, like a man who has hurled himself at his enemy and found him suddenly not there. This reminded him of jiu-jitsu, and this in turn of the ancient Japanese, to whom indeed his Terranovans seemed to have many resemblances. Weaver's uneasiness increased. Savage peoples were notoriously devious. They smiled and then thrust knives between your ribs. He felt a sudden prickling coldness at the thought. It was improbable, it was fantastic, that they would go to such lengths to gratify his every wish if they meant to kill him, he told himself. And then he remembered the Dionysian rites and a host of other two similar parallels. The king for a day or a year, who ruled as an absolute monarch and then was sacrificed. And Weaver remembered with a stab of panic usually eaten. He had been on Terra Nova for a little over a month by the local calendar. What was his term of office to be? Two months? Six? A year? Ten years? He slept little that night, woke late in the morning with dry, irritated eyes and a furred mouth, and spent a silent day inspecting each new batch of natives without comment and shivering inwardly at each motion of the clawed arms of Mark, Luke, or John. Toward the evening he came out of his funk at last, when it occurred to him to ask about weapons. He put the query slyly, wording it as if it were a matter of general interest only, and of no great importance. Were they familiar with machines that killed, and if so, what varieties did they have? At first Mark did not understand the question. He replied that their machines did not kill, that very long ago they had done so, but that the machines were much better now, very safe and not harmful to anyone. Then, wrote Weaver carefully, you have no machines which are made for the purpose of killing. Mark, Luke, and John discussed this with every evidence of excitement. At last Mark wrote, this very new idea to us. But do you have in this world no large dangerous animals which must be killed? How do you kill those things which you eat? No dangerous animals. We kill food things, but not use machines. Give some things food which make them die give some no food so they die, kill some with heat, some eat alive. Weaver winced with distaste when he read this last and was about to write this must stop, 
but he thought of oysters and decided to reserve judgment. After all, it had been foolish of him to be frightened last night. He had been carried away by a chance comparison which calmly considered was superficial and absurd. These people were utterly peaceful, in fact, spineless. He wrote, Take the air car up farther so that I can see this village from above. He signaled John to stop when they had reached a height of a few hundred feet. From this elevation he could see the village spread out beneath him like an architect's model, the neat cross-hatching of narrow streets separating the hollow curves of rooftops dotted with the myriad captive balloons launched in honor of his appearance. The village lay in the gentle hollow of a wide valley surrounded by the equally gentle slopes of hills. To his right it followed the bank of a far-sized river. In the other three directions the checkered pattern ended in a careless, irregular outline and was replaced by the larger pattern of cultivated fields. It was a good site, the river for power, sanitation, and transportation, the hills for a sheltered climate. He saw suddenly in complete sharp detail how it would be. The trip is over, he wrote with sudden decision. We will stay here and build a city. Section 3 the most difficult part was the number of things he had to learn. There was no trouble about anything he wanted done by others. He simply commanded, and that was the end of it. But the mass of knowledge about the Terranovans and their world before he came appalled him, not only by its sheer bulk, but by its intricacy, the unexplained gaps, the contradictions. For a long time after the founding of New Washington, later New Jerusalem, he was still bothered by a little doubt. He wanted to learn all that there was to learn about the Terranovans, so that finally he would understand them completely and the doubt would be gone. Eventually he confessed to himself that the task was impossible. He was forty-seven years old, he had perhaps thirty years ahead of him, and it was not as if he were able to devote them solely to study. There was the written history of the Terranovans, which covered minutely a period of nine thousand years, though not completely. There were periods and places which seemed to have left no adequate records of themselves. The natives had no reasonable explanation of this phenomenon. They simply said that the keeping of histories sometimes went out of fashion. Then there was the biology of Terranovans and the countless other organisms of the planet. Simply to catalogue them and give them English names as he had set out to do would have occupied him for the rest of his lifetime. There was the complex and puzzling field of social relations. Here again everything seemed to be in unaccountable flux, even though the overall pattern remained the same and seemed as rigid as any primitive peoples. There was physics, which presented exasperating difficulties of translation. There was engineering. There was medicine. There was economics. When he finally gave it up, it was not so much because of the simple arithmetical impossibility of the job as because he realized that it didn't matter. For a time he had been tempted away from the logical attitude towards these savages of his, a foolish weakness of the sort that had given him that ridiculous hour or two when he now dimly recalled he had been afraid of the Terranovans afraid of all things, that they were fattening him up for the sacrifice. Whereas it was clear enough, certainly, that the former state of the Terranovans, their incomprehensible society and language and customs, simply had no practical importance. He was changing all that. When he was through, they would be what he had made them, no more and no less. It was strange, looking back, to realize how little he had seen of his destiny there at the beginning timid little man, he thought, half in amusement, half contemptuously, nervous and fearful, seeing things small, build me a house like the one I had in Schenectady. They had built him a palace, no, a temple, and a city, and they were building him a world, a planet that would be his to the last atom when it was done, a corner of the universe that was Algernon James Weaver. He recalled that in the beginning he had felt almost like these creatures' servant public servant, he had thought with self-righteous, lukewarm pleasure. He had seen himself as one who built for others, the more virtuous because those others were not even men. But it was not he who built, they built, and for him. It was strange, he thought again, that he should not have seen it from the first, for it was perfectly clear and all of a pattern. The marriage laws, thou shalt not live in adultery. The dietary laws, thou shalt not eat that which is unclean and the logical concomitant, the law of worship, thou shalt have no gods before me. The apostles Mark, Luke, and John, later Matthew, Philip, Peter, Simon, Andrew, James, Bartholomew, and Thomas. He had a feeling that something was wrong with the list besides the omission of Judas. 
Unluckily he had no Bible, but it was really an academic question. They were his apostles, not that other's. The pattern repeated itself, he thought, but with variations. He understood now why he had shelved the project of Christianizing the natives, although one of his first acts had been to abolish their pagan sects. He had told himself at first that it was best to wait until he had put down from memory the salient parts of the Holy Bible. Genesis, say, the better-known Psalms, and a condensed version of the Gospels, leaving out all the begats and the Jewish tribal history and awkward things like the Songs of Solomon. Thy mandibles are like pomegranates. No, it wouldn't do. And of course he had never found time to rack his brains for the passages that eluded him. But all of that had been merely a subterfuge to soothe his conscience while he slowly felt his way into his new role. Now it was almost absurdly simple. He was writing his own holy book, or rather Luke Thomas and a corps of assistants were putting it together from his previous utterances to be edited by him later. The uneasy rustling of chitinous arms against white robes recalled him from his meditation. The swarm of priests, altar boys, and the rest of his retinue was still gathering around him, waiting until he should deign to notice them again. Really, God thought with annoyance, this wool-gathering, at such a moment. The worshippers were massed in the temple. A low, excited twittering rose from them as he appeared and walked into the beam of the spotlight. The dark lenses of television cameras were focused on him from every part of the balcony at the rear of the hall. The microphones were ready. Weaver walked forward as the congregation knelt and waited an impressive moment before he spread his hands in the gesture that meant, Rise, my children. Simon, previously coached, translated. The congregation rose again, rustling, and then was still. At a signal from Simon, the choir began a skirling and screeching which the disciples warranted to be music, religious music, composed to fit the requirements he had laid down. Weaver endured it, thinking that some changes must come slowly. The hymn wailed to an end, and Weaver gripped the lectern, leaning carefully forward toward the microphones. "'My children,' he began, and waited for Solomon's twittering translation. "'You have sinned greatly,' Twitter, "'and in many ways.' Twitter. But I have come among you, Twitter, to redeem your sins, Twitter, and make them as though they had never been, Twitter. He went on to the end, speaking carefully and sonorously. It was not a long sermon, but he flattered himself that it was meaty. At the end of it he stepped back a pace and folded his arms in the long white silk sleeves across his chest. Simon took over now, and so far as Weaver could judge, he did well. He recited a litany which Weaver had taught him, indicating by gestures that the congregation was to repeat after him every second speech. The low chirping welled from the hall, a comforting warming sound, almost like the responses of a human congregation. Weaver felt tears welling to his eyes, and he restrained himself from weeping openly only by a gigantic effort. After all, he was a god of wrath. But the love which swept towards him at this moment was a powerful thing to gainsay. When it was all over, he went back to his sanctum, dismissed all his retinue except his regular assistants, and removed the ceremonial robes. The people responded well, he said. I am pleased. Simon said, They will work hard to please you, Master. You bring great happiness to them. That is well, said Weaver. He sat down behind his great desk while the others stood attentively below him in the sunken foresection of the sanctum. What business have you for me today? There is the matter of the novel, Master, said Mark. He stepped forward, mounted the single step to Weaver's dais, and laid a sheaf of papers on the desk. This is a preliminary attempt which one called Peter Smith has made with my unworthy help. I will read it later, Weaver told him. It was poor stuff, no doubt. What else could one expect? But it was a start. He would tell them what was wrong with it, and they would try again. Literary criticism, armaments, tariffs, manners. There was no end to it. What else? Luke stepped forward. The plans for the large weapons you commanded your servants to design, Master. He put three large sheets of parchment on the desk. Weaver looked at the neat tracery on the first and frowned. You may come near me, he said. Show me how these are meant to operate. Luke pointed to the first drawing. This is the barrel of the weapon, Master, he said. As you commanded, it is rifled so that the missile will spin. Here the missile is inserted at the breech, according to your direction. Here is the mechanism which turns and aims the weapon as you commanded. It is shown in great detail on this second sheet. And here on the third is the missile itself. 
It is hollow and filled with explosive powder as you ordered, and there is in the tip a device which will attract it to the target." Weaver gravely nodded. Has it been tested? In models only, Master. If you direct, the construction will begin at once. Good. Proceed. How many of these can you make for me within a month? Luke hesitated. Few, Master. At first all must be done by hand methods. Later it will be possible to make many at a time, fifty or even a hundred in one month. But for the first two or three months, Master, two weapons in a month is all that your unworthy servants can do. Very well, said Weaver. See to it. He turned and examined the large globe of the planet which stood on his desk. Here was another product of his genius. The Terranovans had scarcely had maps worthy of the name before his coming. The three major continents trailed downward like fleshy leaves from the North Pole. He had called them America, Europe, and Asia, and they were so lettered on the globe. In the southern hemisphere, besides the tips of Europe and Asia and fully a third of America, there was a fourth continent shaped rather like a hat, which he had called Australia. There was no Africa on Terra Nova, but that was small loss. Weaver had never thought highly of Africa. The planet itself, according to the experts who had been assigned the problem, was a little more than 10,000 miles in diameter. The land area, Weaver thought, probably amounted to more than 50 million square miles. It was a great deal to defend, but it must be done. Here is your next assignment, he told Luke. Put a team to work on selecting and preparing sites for these guns when they are built. There must be one in every thousand square miles. Luke bowed and took the plans away. For otherwise, Weaver thought somberly, another ship might land some day, and how could I trust these children not to welcome it? Sunlight gleamed brilliantly from the broad white marble plaza beyond the tall portico. Looking through the windows, he could see the enormous block of stone in the center of the plaza and the tiny robot aircar hovering near it and the tiny ant shapes of the crowd on the opposite side. Beyond the sky was a clear, faultless blue. Are you ready now, Master? asked Luke. Weaver tested his limbs. They were rigid and almost without sensation. He could not move them so much as a fraction of an inch. Even his lips were as stiff as that marble outside. Only the fingers of his right hand clutching a pen felt as if they belonged to him. A metal frame supported a notepad where his hand could reach it. Then he wrote, Yes, proceed with the statue. Luke was holding a tiny torpedo-shaped object that moved freely at the end of a long jointed metal arm. He moved it tentatively toward Weaver's left shoulder. Outside, the hovering aircar duplicated the motion. The grinder at its tip bit with a screech into the side of the huge stone. Weaver watched, feeling no discomfort. The drug Luke had injected was working perfectly. Luke moved the pantograph pointer again and again until it touched Weaver's robed body. With every motion, the aircar bored a tunnel into the stone to the exact depth required and backed out again. Slowly a form was beginning to emerge. The distant screech of the grinder was muffled and not unpleasant. Weaver felt a trifle sleepy. The top of one extended arm was done. The aircar moved over and began the other, leaving the head still buried in stone. After this, Weaver thought, he could rest. His cities were built, his churches founded, his guns built and tested, his people trained. The Terranovans were as civilized as he could make them in one generation. They had literary societies, newsstands, stock markets, leisure and working classes, baseball leagues, armies. They had to give up their barbaric comfort, of course, so much the better. Life was real. Life was earnest. Weaver had taught them that. The mechanism of his government ran smoothly. It would continue to run with only an occasional guiding touch. This was his last major task, the monument. Something to remember me by, he thought drowsily, myself in stone long after I am gone. That will keep them to my ways, even if they should be tempted. To them I will still be here, standing over them, gigantic, imperishable. They will still have something to worship." Stone dust was obscuring the figure now, glittering in the sunlight. Luke undercut a huge block of the stone, and it fell, turning lazily, and crashed on the pavement. Robot tractors darted out to haul the pieces away. Weaver was glad it was Luke whose hand was guiding the pantograph, not one of the bright, efficient younger generation. They had been together a long time, Luke and he, almost ten years. He knew Luke as if he were a human being, understood him as if he were a person, and Luke knew him better than any of the rest, knew his smiles and his frowns and all his moods. It had been a good life. 
He had done all the things he set out to do, and he had done them in his own time and his own way. At this distance it was almost impossible to believe that he had once been a little man among billions of others conforming to their patterns doing what was expected of him. His free hand was growing tired from holding the pen. When all the rest was done Luke would freeze that hand also, and then it would be only a minute or so until he could inject the antidote. He scribbled idly. Do you remember the old days before I came, Luke? Very well, Master, said the Apostle, but it seems a long time ago. Yes, Weaver told himself contentedly, just what I was thinking. We understand each other, Luke and I. He wrote, Things are very different now, eh? Very different, Master. You made many changes. The people are very grateful to you. He could see the broad outlines of the colossal figure now, the arms in their heavy ecclesiastical sleeves stretched in benediction, the legs firmly planted. But the bowed head was still a rough, featureless mass of stone, not yet shaped. Do you know, Weaver wrote on impulse, that when I first came I thought for a time that you were savages who might want to eat me? That would startle Luke, he thought, but Luke said, We all wanted to very much. But that would have been foolish, Master. Then we would not have had all the other things, and besides there would not have been enough of you for all. The aircar screeched, driving a tunnel along the edge of the parted vestments. God felt a cold wind down the corridor of time. He had been that close after all. It was only because the natives had been cold-bloodedly foresighted that he was still alive. The idea infuriated him, and somehow he was still afraid. He wrote, You never told me of this. You will all do a penance for it. Luke was dabbing the pointer carefully at the bald top of Weaver's head. His horny, complicated face was unpleasantly close, the mandibles unpleasantly big even behind his mouth veil. Luke said, We will very gladly, except that perhaps the new ones will not like it. Weaver felt bewildered. In one corner of his mind he felt a tiny darkness unfolding, the kernel of doubt, forgotten so long but there all the time growing larger now, expanding to a ragged, terrifying shape. He wrote, What do you mean? What are the new ones? Luke said, We did not tell you. We knew you would not like it. A spaceship landed in Asia two months ago. There are three people in it. One is sick, but we believe the other two will live. They are very funny people, Master. The pantograph pointer moved down the side of God's nose, and another wedge of stone fell into the plaza. They have three long legs, and a very little body, and a head with one eye in front and one behind. Also they have very funny ideas. They are horrified at the way we live, and they are going to change it all around." Weaver's fingers jerked uncontrollably, and the words wavered across the page. I don't understand. I don't understand. I hope you are not angry, Master, said Luke. We are very grateful to you. When you came we were desperately bored. There had been no new thing for more than seven thousand years, since the last ship came from space. You know that we have not much imagination. We tried to invent new things for ourselves, but we could never think of anything so amusing as the ones you gave us. We will always remember you with gratitude." The pantograph was tracing Weaver's eyelids and then the unfeeling eyes themselves. "'But all things must end,' said Luke. Now we have these others who do not like what you have done, so we cannot worship you any more. And anyway, some of the people are growing tired. It has been ten years, a long time." One thought pierced through the swirling fear in Weaver's mind. The guns, built with so much labor, the enormous guns that could throw a shell two hundred miles. The crews, manning them night and day to destroy the first ship that came from space. And they had never meant to use them. Anger fought with caution. He felt peculiarly helpless now, locked up in his own body like a prison. What are you going to do? he scrawled. Nothing that will hurt, Master, said Luke. You remember I told you long ago we had no machines for killing before you came. We use other things, like this drug which paralyzes. You will feel no pain. Algernon Weaver's hand, gripping the pen as a drowning man holds to a stave, was moving without his volition. It was scrawling in huge letters over and over, No! 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 It is too bad we cannot wait, said Luke, but it has to be done before the new ones get here. They would not like it, probably. He let the pointer go, and it hung where he had left it. With two jointed claws he seized Weaver's hand and straightened it out to match the other, removing the pen. With a third claw he thrust a slender needle under the skin. Instantly the hand was as rigid as the rest of Weaver's body. 
Weaver felt as if the last door had been slammed, the telephone wires cut, the sod thrown on his coffin. This is the way we have decided, said Luke. It is a shame, because perhaps these new ones will not be as funny as you after all, but it is the way we have decided. He took up the pantograph pointer again. In the plaza the aircar ground at the huge stone head outlining the stern mouth, the resolute bearded jaw. Helplessly Weaver returned the stare of that remorseless brooding face, the face of a conqueror. End of The Worshippers by Damon Knight